to go. Okay, thank you very much and welcome to the first public uh, meeting of 2021 of the Northampton General Hospital Board of Directors. Unfortunately, our chairman, Alan Burns, is unable to attend today. Today's meeting, in consequence, it falls to me as vice chairman to take on that duty. So let's get started with item number one, which is introductions and apologies. Do we have any apologies, Kirsty or Claire? Don't believe so. We have a couple Alan. of... No. Alan. We do... Uh, Alan, <laughs> I've just mentioned Alan, will not be present yet. Apart from Alan, there are no uh, no apologies. A uh, couple of introductions, a couple of new faces around the table. We have Boala Agbula, who uh, it's her first board meeting as interim director of finance. Welcome to you, Boala. And also Karen Spellman, her first board meeting as interim director of strategy and partnerships. Uh, I also see Andy there, Andy Callow. I think everyone knows him from uh, from the board development session um, last month. But this is his first public board meeting as well. So welcome, Andy. Um, declarations of interest. I haven't received any new declarations of interest. Kirsty Clare? No, if not, I take it that the only interests are those recorded in the trust's register. Um, moving on to item three, which are the draft minutes. And we have 14 pages of minutes there. Are there any comments on those minutes? I'll give you a few seconds. I see no hands. Uh, on, on that basis, uh, I will take those minutes as approved as being a fair and accurate record of the meeting that was held on the 26th of November 2020. Um, moving on to matters arising and the action log item 126. That action is completed and I did see that Mark sent out a PowerPoint presentation today um, on, on, on that matter of staff well-being. Um, anything more you want to say on that, Mark? Uh, just, just to say, David, the reason for sending it out again this morning is because it's changing on a weekly basis in terms of the additional right. support that we're putting in for colleagues. So I just wanted to make sure you had the most up-to-date position. We also talked through a number of those items at the group briefing of last Friday lunchtime. Okay, thank you very much. And item 124, that's been deferred to the March board meeting, so a fuller and more detailed report can be given. Um, okay, moving, well, are there any other comments or on matters arising, anything anyone wants to bring up? Nope. Okay, let's move on to item five on the agenda, which is the, the patient story, or more accurately, the patient vlog. And I think at any of our board meetings, the patient story is a key item, if not the key item on the agenda because of course patients and the delivery of excellent care to patients is what our hospital and what our group is all about. And today's story focuses on cancer, cancer patients. Sorry, my screen is changing. Today's story focuses on cancer patients and board members will doubtless have noted uh, that cancer is a thread running through the agenda today. Uh, so without further ado, let me hand you over to Sharon, okay, our chief nurse, who is going to introduce the vlog. Thank you very much, Chair. Finding an unexplained lump, seeking help and advice from a GP and receiving a cancer diagnosis from a hospital consultant and a CNS can cause huge anxiety and have a big, big impact on an individual's life and well-being in normal times. We can't underestimate the impact this has on an individual and their family when this occurs in the midst of a COVID pandemic. I'm really pleased that one of our patients has kindly agreed to tell us his story, a reminder to us of the need for all of us to do all within our power to maintain access for patients who need our help and support. Colleagues, I'd like to introduce you to Colin. Thank you, Kieran. Yeah, I'm Colin Walton. I, uh, I've looked after myself for many years in training for bodybuilding and martial arts. I'm now 62 and found out that last May I had uh, what I thought was just a benign little cyst that's turned out to be a mantle cell lymphoma, which is growing on my jaw. Do you want to show it up? And uh, yeah, it's, it's right there. And unfortunately, I found out only Monday this week that I'd also got it in the bowel as well, which was a bit of a surprise. Yeah. So we're here in Northampton General uh, in their uh, cancer ward um, having treatment for it. And I've been very well looked after, I must say. I can't fault the staff here. They're absolutely lovely. The aftercare is brilliant. 
Well, the diagnosis I had was, firstly, I noticed it just sitting there watching telly one day, and I felt this lump, which was probably the size of a pea in the analogy that I use, that gradually grew bigger and bigger and got to the size of a crab apple. But I thought perhaps I now need to do something about it because people could see it getting bigger and I wasn't really actually bothered about it. Anyway, the top and tail of it was I did get in to see a doctor and immediately he saw me and said, you've got cancer. So straight away, no ifs and buts about it, you've got cancer. And I thought, OK, fine, you know, right, what we've got to do next? And he said, well, we've got to refer you straight in. We got in, we had a CT scan and I had an immediate reaction to the iodine contrast dye that they give you. That stabilised. Uh, then I had a, a, a needle biopsy that came back negative. So we were still no wiser as to what exactly I was suffering from at that stage. Time went on and then they requested a PET scan. And from there on, it was a waiting game um, because I then got eventually to see a surgeon who had done the original biopsy, which I had, which was sent to Leicester on the 23rd of November. So we've got a mantle cell lymphoma. And so at the moment, we've just had the second course of chemo and hopefully... Touch wood, everything's working out okay. No side effects from it. The whole aspect of how I was treated when I came in, the explanation that I was given how I would receive my treatment, um, the professionalism of when I had a reaction, because I wasn't sure whether I'd get one and how quickly that was dealt with. Um, COVID was never brought up. Um, so no, no reason why it should be brought up, because obviously I'm here as a cancer patient not to be just pushed to one side, oh, sorry, Carl, we'll get back to you in a minute. We've got to go over to somewhere else. I had none of that at all. So we've had this about eight months now. And the problem is with that, if, it, if I'd gone as early as May, they might not have had it big enough to do anything with. So we would have still have had to wait anyway. And with the, with the problem with COVID at the moment, everybody probably who's got cancer, or certainly most of us, will probably be sidelined because they need all the specialists they can get nursing staff that even ones that have been retired coming back out into the system to deal with this horrible onslaught of COVID, which is just essentially taking over the country at the moment. And I can understand the stress they're all under and they do a marvellous job. They really, really do. Um, but they've got to remember that you've still got other diseases. You've got Alzheimer's, you've got dementia, you have the cancers in their numerous forms and they're all got to be treated somewhere. The staff doing a marvellous, marvellous job. I mean, I can't complain, and I would not. I, I, I couldn't see Northampton down, and Northampton General Hospital was crazy enough. Yes, my partner is, she would love to see me uh, and come in, as you do, but of course, because of COVID, you cannot. I was in an isolation room at first, and she could have come down, but she would have unfortunately been standing the other side of the window with her phone, talking to me through a window on my phone. But it's not the same. You can't cuddle each other and have that, that contact in the same way. I think that is an issue, but there's nothing we can do. We need to protect as many people as we can. And I think people are beginning to understand that. If you're in here for a long period of time, then that could be a real issue. And for a lot of people with mental anxiety, that's a major problem at the moment. And luckily, I'm not of the sort that's got that issue, but that doesn't mean we're all the same. I think um, looking at what I've been told to take, that's a learning curve. So I've learned a lot about this in the last few days. Now, the lovely nurse called Sam, who spent a good hour telling me about what to expect. And, that, and uh, all the chemotherapy and all the paperwork. And I've read that right the way through everything she gave me. And a couple of things I asked about, and she's on the ball. That's, that's what this is. So so how we're going to do this. Specialised nurses and, and nurses that know about your treatment was important. It was, it was important. Yeah. Information to be accessible to you. Absolutely, because I think if somebody just tells you all this, you're going to take some of it in, yeah. but then some of it you're going to forget. But I think if you've got something written, but it's in a book form, which is like a diary and a regulated pattern in this book, and therefore you can refer back to it, you know what you're going to have, and it minimises any more risks. Because when you suddenly go to leave hospital, and start administering it yourself, the last thing you want to do is make a mistake. And because then if you get any trouble, you've got the cards they're giving you, which has got the phone number on, you've got your hospital number on, there's somebody always at the end of that phone who will immediately you know, ask you either to come straight in or they could help you over the phone. So good because, you know, you're given step-by-step -step guidance all the way through that, which is really, you know, really helpful. I know it's very difficult at the moment seeing doctors. It's incredibly difficult. I had this problem with mine 
Um, I asked a chemist before I saw my doctor, which actually that surgery was next to my doctor's, and my doctor had sent me a doctor link on my phone, which I had to tap into to make an appointment, and it kept throwing me off, so I had no option but to go to the surgery. And most surgeries are locked, so people cannot just walk in and out and make these, because obviously they're trying to protect themselves. But luckily for me, and it was pure luck, there was a receptionist there, I asked her what's what, and she said, I shouldn't be doing this, but I will help you. I'll make the appointment while you're here. And then she sent that through to my phone, and then I turned up, and that's when the doctor, when I saw him, said, you've got cancer. So if it wasn't for her, I might have had a longer period of time before I got seen, just because of the difficulties ringing up, because you just can never get through. And I know a lot of us have got that problem right now, and that is very frustrating. And you're going to your doctors, and because of COVID, which has changed everything, it's much more difficult. So as soon as you find something, don't hesitate. Please get in touch with your doctors because it, it's the difference really between life and death, and I really do advocate that. So um, would it be fair to say that kind of in summary, the things that you feel like are really important to you as a patient is that support, the information and being able to access support when you're at home? Yes, I do, yeah. I believe it is, yeah, very much so. Thank you for speaking to everyone today. Do you want to just introduce Alvin? Oh, this is Alvin. Yeah, just so you can see. This is this lymphoma that actually started as a tiny little pea, and now he's a big old boy. And I can't get him off my shelf at the moment, so I call him a bit of a squatter, really. Alvin has come from a colleague of mine that decided to call it Alvin because of Alvin and the chipmunks. So we affectionately call him Alvin. Lovely. Thank you, Colin, for taking time. No worries. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Sh Sharon, do you want to add anything to that? No, I, I think um, I, I think Chair that um, Colin has, has said it all. Really, um, the challenges that our patients are facing in seeking help um, and support through their GPs to get through to acute care, um, and we are so focused uh, as an organisation on how we can improve and get our access right for patients. And I'm sure as we progress through the board meeting that will become more apparent. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Colin did paint a, uh, you know, a, a fascinating picture of what he's experienced and, you know, his personal struggle with cancer in, in, in quite an amusing way. And it was good to see the air of optimism which came through and certainly his appreciation of the NHS during extremely difficult times. So um, any any further questions, comments on that? I see De uh, Debbie, you have your hand up. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Chair. Um, so I think a couple of things there. Firstly, thank you to Colin for sharing his story. Um, quite powerful, really, because we are surrounded at the moment in a world of COVID. And we mustn't forget that there are other patients out there that are not COVID and actually have nothing to do with COVID. So I think that's the first thing. Um, and I'm grateful to him for talking to us about that, actually, because coming into hospital when you haven't got COVID is or, or can be quite a scary place. Um, but we are here. We're here for the whole population. So, um, yeah, just just that's what I, I wanted to say. Thank you to him, really. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, Jill, sorry. Um, yeah, Jill, your hands up. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. I, I um, wanted to echo what uh, Debbie's just said, but Colin is such a fantastic advert for the population. I wondered if there was an opportunity, um, with his permission, to perhaps put the little clip on, on our website, because um, I know there's members of the public watching us today, but there may not be that many. Um, and we really do need to get the message out there that um, when, you have some, when you have some concerns and worries, you, you really do need to um, make contact with your doctor and we are here for you. And I thought he did it so well. It'd be wonderful to use him as part of our advertising campaign, if you like. Please seek help. We're here for you, regardless of COVID. Yeah, indeed. Thank you, Jill. Um, Simon. Thanks, David. Um, so um, just firstly, in addition to the comments that people have all made, it's perhaps the first opportunity to thank um, today, as we go through the discussions, um, the wonderful cancer teams who we've got, um, who work to maintain, who have worked to maintain and continue to maintain um, treatment for the many hundreds and thousands of people who um, uh, unfortunately suffer from cancer. So I just wanted to start by 
taking this first opportunity to thank them. And as you rightly said, David, we will come back um, across our board meeting today to talk more about what we're going to do to continue to maintain our services. It is, of course, a consequence of COVID that um, uh, cancer treatment, like many other treatments, has had to um, sometimes be delayed. And we will talk um, during our board today, particularly when we get to the reset and recovery report about the work we're doing to maintain access to treatment. But I finally wanted to say, just as, 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 uh, as colleagues know, I'm doing some national work just in terms of access and particularly maintaining elective access. And it's very clear that one of the things that will be prioritised throughout the whole of the year ahead as we move out of this wave of COVID into elective recovery will be cancer. Um, so it's right that we're having the discussions today to really set our scene for not just where are we now, but what are our aspirations for the year ahead? Because we now need to look forward and say, um, we've been through the most incredibly tough time, but we've now got to get back to the standard of cancer care that people had pre-COVID and not only get back to that, but as I hopefully will hear during the course of our discussions today, improve upon it over the, over the coming year. Um, it's a really important strategic theme for us as a group. It's a really important role for Northampton Hospital. And um, I'm looking forward to the debate that we have today on our plans, as well as on how we've done. Thanks. Thank you, Simon. Further questions on the patient vlog? If not, I'm sure we all echo your words of thanks, Simon, to everyone who's involved in the the provision of cancer care to our patients here in Northampton and the group in general. Really tremendous job that's being done. And I know that Deb has always got that message out there that cancer is our priority. And, um, you know, it's good to hear um, the, the words of Colin there, which are, are really quite optimistic. And I, you know, I, I, I think what Jill says as well is very true that, you know, he, he really is a kind of model patient, isn't he? he he's an ad burden. The more, the, the more he's heard by the population at large, I think, um, uh, I think the better it is. So if there are no further questions, comments, shall we move on to item six, which is the chairman's report. Um, and I'm sure you'll all understand that taking over at the last minute, I really don't have too much of a report. Um, there are a couple of announcements we need to make formally at the board, however, um, regarding new appointments. The first is Andy Callow, who we introduced at the start of this meeting. Uh, Andy is going to be expanding his current role and taking on a new position as group uh, digital and information officer for the group. So congratulations, Andy. Um, Secondly, our very own Debbie Needham will be taking over the position of CEO of KGH. Um, Debbie has really made a tremendous contribution here at uh, Northampton General over the years, but this really is a great opportunity opening up for Debbie and we wish you the, the very best of luck. And this is your last public board meeting. So thank you very much from all of us. Um, the third appointment is that of John Evans, who will be taking over as the Group Chief Financial Officer, and I believe he'll be taking over in June, Simon, correct? Yeah. Um, John is currently Director of Finance in Oxford. Uh, he has significant experience working within groups, managing within groups, both in Oxford and in other senior roles within the NHS, and he really should be a bring a tremendous value added to us, to our group here in Northamptonshire. Um, finally, uh, Jo Forkus will be moving from to Northampton General from her current position as COO of KGH uh, as interim COO from March of this year for a nine month period. So they're the four appointments I want to mention. Um, the only other thing I forgot to mention earlier on was concerning the fact that we're going to have a break at apparently 10.58. Uh, we'll have a seven minute break. I'm not too sure why it's seven minutes, but we'll have a seven minute break, comfort break, apparently it's called in my notes here. Um, so that's for everyone's information. Okay, so that's the chairman's report. Um, now let me hand you over to a far more fuller report, I think, from, from Simon, uh, our group chief executive. Morning, everybody. Um, good to see you all. And um, 
I hope this new year is for all of us in so many ways a, a happier one than 2020 is. That's probably the last time I'm going to do a happy new year or anything like it. I want to start, as I said, um, by, um, I've already touched on um, the uh, teams that provide our cancer care, but um, just on behalf of us all paying um, my most heartfelt and fulsome tribute to our staff right across um, the organization. Um, since we last met, we have met and endured and continue to endure um, a much more significant wave too. Um, and that I think has tested everybody to their limit. It's important to say that I think at the start of our conversation, and it's right that as we go forward in terms of thinking about um, our coming boards, we are going to be spending a lot of time thinking about our staff and our people and how we best support them. Um, and I want to signal immediately, you know, that today we're going to be starting to think both a little bit publicly, but mostly privately about our people plan. And at the heart of our people plan, we need to absolutely focus on making sure that our staff feel that we are there for them when they have been there for their communities in oh so many ways over this last period. As we speak, um, the hospital is still pretty full with COVID. Debbie will no doubt talk more about that in her report. Um, but we've obviously not only been dealing with COVID, um, we've been dealing with winter uh, and we've been dealing with, as we've already talked about, the need to uh, get our elective work um, back up and running. Um, and all three priorities, our staff have been there in the front line. Um, and as I've been often, I've often said, but want to say again here, there's no single front line in COVID, whether you're a porter, whether you're in that cancer waiting list team, whether you're an admin um, receptionist, um, whether you're a surgeon, whether you're a physio, whether you're an OT, everybody has been on their own front line in COVID. And I just wanted to spend a moment to say thank you once again. And hopefully for those that are watching, they will feel the testament of our seriousness of the support in the effort that we put into talking about what we can do to care for people. And the only other point I wanted to make around that, I suppose, was to say that um, the consequences of what we've been through maybe won't be immediately seen. They will be seen in the months to come. And so this is something we're going to need to constantly pay attention to over the, the whole of the year ahead. I also wanted to acknowledge um, the loss that people have experienced in our communities. We reached a truly horrific and grim milestone in our country this week of 100,000 people having lost their lives, at least from COVID. And that is a milestone that I think um, is hard to comprehend, let alone uh, talk about in any meaningful way. Um, and we know that many people in Northampton and in our county more broadly have lost loved ones. And I know that all of us again would want to express our deep and sincere condolences for all of those losses. Um, each one of them is felt by someone somewhere. And um, we as, uh, as, as healthcare providers um, share in those losses and uh, grieve alongside you. Um, we are, as I've said, still in the uh, thick of it, really, in terms of wave two. Um, so the first part of my report really reminds us all, and again, as was emphasised this week, um, the need to maintain the lockdown. Um, that is the best thing for those people watching I can ask you to do to support us, is to keep the social distancing, keep the lockdown, um, we all know it is hard, um, but it's the fastest way we know to get the vaccination, get the uh, virus under control and allow the benefits of the vaccination programme to be felt. Um, we'll talk a little bit more today um, about our vaccination hubs. Um, 
And I think um, that's been a truly phenomenal achievement, um, both here in Northampton, but also across the country. Um, it is um, our best hope of getting a sustainable uh, recovery in place. Um, and um, I won't spoil the thunder of the discussion other than to say, um, I just wanted to upfront thank people for all that they have done um, to get that programme in place, to get it rolling, to get so many people through. Um, it again shows the ability and flexibility of the NHS in a crisis. We got it from a, I think, from a shell to a, um, a fully fledged operational construct in under a week, which I think is an amazing um, achievement. Looking to the future today, we will also debate our, our group strategy. Um, um, I'll leave my, my formal remarks to that item on the agenda, but one of the things I want to encourage us to do is when you're in the middle of a, um, a, a pandemic, a crisis of any sort, it becomes very difficult to look beyond the immediate. But for us to do the best by our staff, our patients, our communities, we now need to sort of think into the future and think where do we want to be and how will we get there. Um, so I, in conclusion, I, uh, um, I just wanted to also uh, uh, just take a moment to acknowledge the appointments that you referred to, um, David, and thank and congratulate all those who've been appointed. I'd just like to add my own thanks, obviously, to Carl, who's um, been carrying the baton of the Chief Operating Officer Genuinely, um, as somebody who has done that job in the past, um, I know that it's um, the original thankless job in an, in an organisation. Everybody thinks they know your job better than you do. Everybody's got an opinion on how you should do your job. That's a bit of a coups mantra coming out there or an ex-coups mantra. And um, just wanted to extend on behalf of us all um, my thanks to Carl for... Um, holding the fort in what has been a hugely difficult time. Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Simon. So questions for uh, Simon, please. <coughs> well, you've been let off the hook there, I think, Simon. Or I think everyone's probably waiting to hear from Debbie, one of the two. <laughs> But I think um, I, I think in your comments, I think uh, you speak for the board in a number of the points you mentioned there, especially our sincere thanks to to people for the tremendous job they're doing at the moment. Um, so, OK, if there are no questions for Simon, let's move on to item eight on the agenda, which is indeed the hospital chief executive report. So um, over to you, Debbie. Thanks, Chair. Um, so I'm going to start with COVID. Uh, so today we have got 178 COVID positive patients in our hospital. Um, 14 of those are in critical care. And over the last couple of weeks, we've had to increase our critical care capacity and move some of our critical care patients into the theatre area to be cared for there. So during the second wave, um, the numbers at the moment seem relatively OK, 178. But during the second wave, we've peaked at 254 patients, which is far higher than the first wave, if you recall. However, over the last seven days, those numbers have decreased by around about 75 patients. So case rates within the community, as you know, within some areas of the community, have started to decrease. We are starting to see that decrease also with our admissions into the organisation. We've still not reduced down to the peak, though, that we saw in wave one. And nationally, this is now expected to be mid to late February. So whilst the reduction nationwide um, and also locally is quite good, we've still got to remember that that case rate is still extremely high. So we've still got quite a way to go here. And I was, uh, whilst this is quite difficult, it's a difficult time for everybody. I was pleased to hear from the Prime Minister yesterday about the extension of the tier four lockdown um, until March, uh, at the earliest March. 
So as, as um, Simon said, our hospital is still really busy. Uh, we've got increased workload. The staff are covering um, quite an excessive amount of sickness. Um, and they're also working additional hours. They, uh, our staff are witnessing higher numbers of deaths every single day than they would do. Some of our staff are contracting the virus and some of our staff are undertaking different roles. They're changing their roles, they're increasing what they do and they're taking on new roles, all of which is taking a toll on our staff. They are tired. I was down in the um, same day emergency care unit this morning before board talking to the staff and while they're upbeat they are tired and they did tell me they, they, they told me that they're tired and that they're struggling when they take their downtime to be able to switch off. So you may have read in the, um, in the press over the last month about some research which has been undertaken at King's College and the University of Birmingham. And this is about how staff coped during the first wave. And we've got to just think here, that was the first wave. We know that the second wave was worse. Within the research, almost 50% of staff that they interviewed were reporting symptoms of anxiety, problem drinking, PTSD, depression. Um, and sadly, one in seven members of staff were having thoughts of suicide or self-harm in a different way. So, as I say, this was in the first wave. So just think where we are now. And, and now more than ever, it's really important that we don't just look after ourselves, but we look after our people in the organisation. We know ourselves of the negative impact that COVID has had on all of us over the last year and our own quality of life outside of work and inside work. But the, the potential now for that to be impacting on the provision of high quality care that we're used to providing, we just need to be mindful of that. And some of our staff are going home feeling guilty that they've not been able to provide the exceptional care that they're used to because they are so stretched. So on page 29 of my report, I've outlined the support that we put in place for our staff, um, all of which will clearly be in place for quite some time to come. And it is important that we do continue that, that support to our staff. We've raised health and wellbeing um, quite much higher on our risk register in the last week. It is something that, that continues to keep me awake at night um, being concerned about our staff and are we doing enough for them? I think we are, but we can never do enough. We can't do enough communication and we must continue to offer that, that support that's needed. And what's important for us as a leadership team is that we continue to speak out. Um, it is okay to not be okay but it's also not okay to stay that way. So we must continue to talk. Um, I won't go through the rest of my report in detail without the exception of, I must note and acknowledge cancer here. We've talked about cancer um, already this morning and we will continue to talk about cancer and the performance through the rest of this board meeting. We are making exceptional progress and I would like to just acknowledge again the cancer teams that are working on this and the operational teams and our consultant and nursing staff who are doing a fantastic job with making sure that patients get through their pathway on time. December performance is not yet validated for 62 day ca uh, cancer, but it is very near target. So we will be able to update you on that further in the next board meeting. My final note really is to um, just mention that this is my last uh, public board meeting at Northampton General. And I would really like to offer my sincere thanks to the whole trust board, but especially the executive team um, who have just been a, a massive support to me throughout certainly uh, the last six years on the board, but the 16 years that I've been, been at NGH and the opportunities and support that you've all given me um, very much so, Simon. So thank you. Um, I've been exceptional. So thank you to you all. And I'll stop there and take any questions. Thank you very much, Debbie. Questions for Debbie? Oh, 
You seem to have a problem with your audio, John. It's very croaky, I think is probably the word. It's like that or your voice, and I don't think it's your voice. <laughs> Can you hear me any better now? No, it's still yeah. fairly croaky. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, Debbie, did you get the gist of the... Uh... Uh, no, I don't know if anybody else did. Yeah, uh, otherwise, if you maybe put something in our chat, John, I'll be able to answer it that way. De Debbie, I think John was just asking if we had a comparison between our cancer performance and other trusts of a similar size and, and how we might compare it in, in that context. Yeah, absolutely. So we don't, um, Carl will come on to this in his um, in his performance report. We, um, we don't have the December number to benchmark against yet nationally, but we are, November, we're just slightly below the national average. Okay, thank you. Further questions? Can I just ask you a question, Debbie, and it's about COVID patients in the hospital. Uh, the number has come down, which is good news, yeah? From the peak, it's now at about just over 200, I think. Uh, I mean, we hear a lot, we see a lot in the press about the new variants, the UK variant, the South Africa variant. What variant are the COVID patients in our hospital coming in with? Do we know or do we not know? I don't have that information, David. Um, Sharon, as Director of Infection Prevention and Control, may do, um, but I think that we are seeing a mixture. Right, um, right. But, but Sharon is probably best to answer that. However, all the patients that come in are being treated exactly the same, regardless uh, of the variant. Um, the number that we have in today is actually 178, so it's below 200 now, which is, which is good news. Yeah. It Sharon. was just a question purely out of interest. Yeah, Sharon, sorry, did you have an answer? I was just going to say, I, I have nothing to add, um, De Debbie. It's a mixture of patients that we, we have coming in, um, but every patient is, is treated the same. Yeah, and, and from a clinical point of view, there is no different way of treating patients with different variants? No. Not that I'm aware of. Right, okay. So COVID is COVID as far as treatment is concerned, yeah. Yeah, and we are streaming patients in the same way and treating them in the same way with our zoned wards. Yes. Excellent. Okay, further questions for the hospital CEO? Yeah, I had one quick question. Sure. There you go. Thank you. Yes, uh, hi, Debbie. Um, I know that we've been fortunate enough to get some support from the military um, to, to really help um, with our staffing levels. I wonder if you could say just a little bit more about what they're doing to help us. Yeah, we have got, we have had, we've been lucky to have some support from the military. Um, these are not clinical staff, so I think that's the first thing to note, but we are extremely grateful for the help that they're giving us. Um, Sharon is leading this piece of work and we have pairs of um, non-clinical staff who are going out to our ward areas to do things like um, talk to the patients, make sure that they're able to talk to the relatives, help to give out the food, um, help with answering the phones, any questions that are coming through from visitors and uh, from relatives rather and carers, um, and just generally integrating and being part of the team. We have only got them for a very short period, but um, they're very, very welcome in the organisation. I'm really grateful to them for coming. I don't know if you want to add to that, Sharon? No, we're just very excited. Um, I'm sure they're going to... Uh, uplift uh, uplift our workforce as well so they couldn't be coming at a better time and they are so welcome uh, and just to add to that they are non-clinical rather than clinical that's what you're saying debbie yeah yes, that's right yeah okay excellent no that's great great to have them yeah okay further questions for debbie as i said earlier on you're really at a going to be a loss to northampton general hospital but our losses kettering's gains so you know <laughs> Best of luck to you there, Debbie, and thank you for everything you've done here. Uh, you'll be missed not only by the board, but you know, three, four, five thousand people out there amongst our uh, uh, amongst our uh, staff. Thank you. So, um, I think we're still going to keep with you. We're going to move on now to the performance section of the agenda and the integrated performance report. And I think you're going to introduce that, Debbie. I am. Um, yes. For the wicked, yeah. 
<laughs> yes, I am going to introduce it. Thank you. So um, you'll see over the next two papers, actually, the, the improvements that we are starting to make, um, not only in cancer, but also with our recovery, um, albeit we are still in the middle of a um, quite a, 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 well, a big pandemic. Um, the, the wave two of COVID is, is still with us. Um, and as I say, our staff are still feeling that. But we are doing fantastic. There isn't a day goes by that I'm not proud of something that our staff have done. Um, and, and I'm probably going to start by handing over to Matt, if that's OK, Matt, for you to comment on your areas within the, um, the performance report, please. Yeah, certainly. Thank you, Debbie. Um, so, and just difficult to completely get away from COVID, isn't it? So, start off with, I think it'd be worth mentioning that we have increased our um, intensive care capacity to 200% of what is contracted, um, which has had a significant impact. We've had to move into our main theatres and other areas to deliver that, um, both in terms of space, equipment and staffing. Um, but we have done so and we have done so safely. We've also increased our capacity for um, CPAP and NIV, um, just to be explicit. Those are the levels of respiratory support, shy of invasive ventilation, um, but with additional pressure and oxygen um, to help people breathe. Um, and typically the trust might have only five patients um, at any one time requiring that level of support um, and we've increased our capacity up to 36 percent and through um, very careful management both in terms of location training and expertise and use of the right bits of kit at the right times we've managed to make sure that we stay safely within our oxygen envelope whilst we're doing that um, and also in order to make sure we are getting the best possible care to patients as early as possible when they join us with COVID. Um, we've set up a separate consultant-led respiratory COVID rotor, um, which has helped make sure we're, we're delivering the right treatments. Um, we have had to redistribute our medical staff from um, largely surgical teams to support medicine. Um, and we have um, redeployed clinical assistants, those being largely drawn from our medical students and um, again to support the the pressure on our medical wards at the moment um, and you know really proud of the way that the teams have embraced that and and got on with it um, the moving away from covid for a moment um, the since at our last board meeting we approved the academic strategy um, as was also approved at Kettering general hospital board um, and it, we're full steam ahead with developing the job descriptions, um, several of which have already been passed through to the University of Leicester, and we're anticipating being able to advertise those shortly for um, associate professor posts because they will be key enablers of the group becoming a university hospitals group. Um, and our research activity through COVID um, has been uh, phenomenal. Um, we remain um, one of the key contributors to many of the urgent public health studies um, responding to, to COVID, which are helping to improve our treatment and significantly reduce mortality um, for our patients who are unfortunately sick with COVID. Um, and we've got nearly an 80% increase in rate of recruitment into research studies. We're doing a lot of work to support our international uh, medical, international medical graduates. Um, arriving in this country unfamiliar with the NHS, that's being led by a Bain Clinical Fellow. Um, and in terms of the exception reports, just to say that the um, BTE assessment work, in particular reintroducing EPMA with the support of Andy Callow, thank you, um, we're making great progress and anticipate end of quarter four, beginning of quarter one of next year, um, having an integrated forced VT assessment at the time of prescription. Um, and there has been an increase in the rate of cesarean section. Um, we are undertaking work at the moment to understand why that is, because there have been no change in clinical pathways. There has been a um, change in the fetal monitoring guidance, and we wonder if that's partly, partly behind it. There have been no 
safety um, issues raised by it, but we do need to understand it better. And there is a currently a case series review going on and will be monitored through the quality committee. That's all I need to say, thank you. Thanks, Matt. We'll move through to Carl now from an operational point of view and then maybe take some questions at the end. Lovely, thank you, Debbie. Um, I think as, as it's been clearly um, uh, articulated, uh, COVID dominates the uh, performance report uh, and we continue to see obviously high numbers of COVID patients. Um, we're currently, you know, at our peak, we, we hit 260 COVID patients, which is almost 50% of our general bed base. So that, that challenge for our clinical teams has been huge, but the performance um, uh, on, on the back of that to deliver uh, our non-COVID uh, um, activity has been uh, some of the stuff I've really risen to. Um, obviously today we're talking about cancer in particular so I'll start with the cancer performance uh, and the activity you have in front of you relates to November um, but we were for a 62 day performance so that's from referral to first definitive treatment uh, we sat at 76 percent which is an, an increase of 15 percent uh, in two months um, which is just phenomenal and December's figures which will be validated in the next few days should see us a around just a smidgen under 85 percent which equates to a 25 percent improvement in cancer performance in three months which you know given the backdrop of where we've been is just incredible and my thanks go out to the teams for the incredible work they've done um, added to that we are also delivering um, we continue to deliver our two-week cancer target we're delivering the 31-day cancer target and the 28-day faster diagnosis target as well um, so that so the 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 whole sort of um, bag of uh, cancer targets we are delivering and uh, that is and it's improved month on month um, our legacy patients post COVID-1 were at 150 they're now down to 46 and our 104 day patients um, post COVID were at 69 they're now down to eight um, challenge going forward will be to maintain this performance going for go, going going as we come out of COVID um, we've moved all our cancer surgery to the independent sector um, but that only equates to around 50 percent of the work that we would normally do um, so um, we're reviewing the situation daily to uh, see how we can get our theatres back open once COVID starts to reduce um, uh, of, with our expanded critical care in there at this present time. Um, moving on to urgent care, uh, four hour performance has clearly been a real challenge during the COVID on top of the usual winter pressures. Uh, performance was 7% down on the previous month and 3% down on this time last year. Um, but our and our attendances have been around 75% of what we would normally have through the A&E department, but our ambulance numbers continue to climb. So the acuity uh, has been exceptionally high, obviously predominated by patients with COVID. Uh, the focus in ED has been absolutely on patients, uh, patient safety and patients have not been moved to any base wards until their COVID status has been known. Um, and, you know, what we've perhaps been clear about is patients are not placed on corridors where uh, directly from ambulances uh, because it's not safe and it could easily spread COVID throughout the hospital, which is what we do not want to do. Uh, from an elective point of view, um, elective care has been... When we came out of COVID, our elective waits were around 16 and a half weeks for a first appointment. Um, these have continued to fall and currently sit at nine and a half weeks, uh, which is below the standard that was set us by, uh, by, by NHS England. Um, the biggest challenge coming out of COVID was 52 weeks, um, and we started at 637 patients. Uh, that reduced to five, 590, 542 in December. So we've taken around 100 patients off that um, off, the, off that piece, off those, off those numbers. Um, my worry going forward with this is obviously the impact of our theatres being converted into um, uh, ITU capacity um, and moving obviously our work to the independent sector. So that will be a challenge going forward. Uh, I plan to bring a revised trajectory and plan to the next finance performance committee uh, around our 52 week position. Uh, and we continue to explore all options with insourcing, outsourcing and the independent sector. Uh, finally, diagnostic performance continues to improve. Um, Post-COVID was 46% the first phase. Uh, we're now back up to 78%. And all modalities are working at greater than 100% of last year's activity. With certainly using the independent sector, our MRI and CT now is back within booking within six weeks. Um, we've, bum, we've begun replacing the uh, air handling units in our, in, in our endoscopy units. 
uh, and the two rooms that we've commissioned at Daintree uh, for endoscopy are now up and fully, fully functional. So a huge amount of work has gone on over the last few, a few months and the performance is, is, is more than I could have expected. And that's down to the sheer hard work of the teams. Thank you, Debbie. Thanks, Carl. So really good progress on cancer um, and 52 weeks so far. But of course, because we have been um, just doing some operating over at the Three Shires, we know that our 52 week numbers will probably start to increase. We will be insourcing, outsourcing um, throughout the next month um, and actually throughout the next um, probably financial year. Um, and we've also moved endoscopy to Daintree, which um, I think is, is something to acknowledge because uh, that the area at Daintree has been empty for quite some time and we've now managed to get a service over to Daintree and that's working really well mm. and I know that it's, um, it's really welcomed by our patients. One of the things that I, um, I also must just let you know is as I spoke earlier about benchmarking, I didn't tell you about the East Midlands cancer performance. So our performance for 62 days is above the East Midlands average. Um, and in fact, we are uh, within the top three within the East Midlands. Days. So making really good progress on cancer. We did say this was our priority and we've absolutely stuck to that. So uh, thanks, Carl. Well done. OK, I'm going to move on now. Um, to Sharon, if that's okay, Sharon, um, to come on to quality. And then let's take some questions after quality on operational performance and, and quality, if that's okay. Thank you. So, thank you, Debbie. Um, I'm going to take um, the report um, as produced as read, but I clearly, as my colleagues have done, would like to go back and highlight the situation with regard to our COVID response and IPC. Our real emphasis has continued throughout the past months on maintaining safety, both for our staff and our patients. We've got a really proactive IPC team who are out and about supporting all areas um, and educating and training staff to the best of their ability. In December, we had out eight outbreaks over a range of clinical and administrative areas, and that came with a challenge, but we got through that um, and kind of continued to make progress. Since late November, we've seen an increase in the incidence of COVID cases within the trust. A number of those have been asymptomatic patients. We've also seen a decrease in the number of hospital acquired cases, which is really positive. And that's continued into January as well, a really sharp decline in hospital acquired. The actions that we've put in place to support and maintain safety is we've increased ventilation, um, we've issued more blankets, obviously, because opening the windows um, comes with it, its challenges. Um, we've introduced swabbing. Um, it's a national requirement on day three of a patient's stay. Previously, we we're only swabbing on day one, day five, but we've now gone to one, three and five. And that has had a positive impact in terms of identifying positive patients. We've re revisited our zoning policy in the trust to make sure that we can maintain safety in that way. And we've also been encouraging patients to wear masks where it is feasible to do so. You remember as a board that we've discussed in the past the IPC BAF and the associated action plan. Um, we have, I've taken that to QGC last week and updated QGC on the progress that we've made. And most notably, we've seen a huge increase in the number of staff trained in PPE. That now sits in excess of 80%. 80, 80 and Stuart's team have led a successful recruitment and expanded the numbers of domestic services team, which has permitted a more responsive service, um, which has also helped us. We will continue to report progress through um, and concerns through to QGC, but I just wanted to highlight progress and concerns made to board now. Thank you, Debbie. Thanks, Sharon. So if I could just open for questions and ask the committee chairs um, quality and uh, finance and performance to offer any comments, please. Tom, do you want to go first? So, so, David, I was going to let um, Jill comment on behalf of QGC because she chaired our committee um, last week. Thank you very much. Um, a lot of, of what we discussed in the quality committee last week is on the agenda or we've already covered. Um, 
you've got a, an agenda item on the Ockenden report, which we discussed in quite a lot of detail. So I won't say much more about that because we're coming on to it. We also discussed the, um, our response to the National Neonatal Critical Care Review um, and uh, looked at the action plan and, and approved the action plan in relation to that. Those two items are, are, are critical to be um, delivered upon uh, of, of national um, clinical outcome and reputational importance. So we suggested that they were put on the uh, corporate risk register, even though there are many, many mitigations and lots of work underway to deliver what is required to be delivered. Other than that, we noted the really good progress on uh, cancer performance, uh, yes again. Um, the COVID-19 vax, which again on the uh, agenda later on. Improvement on the IPC BAF, where the training numbers continue to improve, which is very encouraging. Uh, the reset report that Carl um, submitted, we, we, um, we heard how, despite the context in which staff are working, that we are managing to achieve um, significant numbers on our, on our reset plan. We also had a very good discussion in relation to ethics because many of you would have seen in the media um, some discussion about how you prioritize care for um, COVID patients and whether some patients uh, need override as others. So our medical director um, assured us that we've thankfully not had to have that um, decision making within the organization, but we do have um, an ethics committee and some really strong terms of reference to support that should we, should we need um, to be in that position. Hopefully we won't, um, as we're hearing earlier, that, that the numbers are falling and with all the um, national restrictions in place, let's hope we don't um, ever need to refer to that committee. I don't think there's anything else I need to say unless anybody uh, thinks I've missed anything. Thanks, Jill. Any further questions on performance or quality? I'm scanning for hands. No. Yeah. yeah. Should we move on then, Bola? Are you happy to? Oh, have we got a hand, John? I can't yes. see you. Sorry, um, oh, well, we can hear you. Hope, hopefully, you can hear me this time. Good. Um, can I just, uh, in terms of uh, stranded patients, is the ICAN um, project starting to deliver benefit to us yet? Carl. Thanks, John. Uh, Yes, there is. Um, obviously, the ICAM program is a is a long term program to change the the way we deliver discharge across the across the system. So it will be with us for at least eighteen months uh, going forward. So, but we're taking the early learning from the ICAM work to implement in, into that. And certainly, from a standard super standard point of view, uh, both myself, uh, the medical director, and the director of nursing are working as a team to target uh, discharge across the organisation. And we've seen a a, a significant re reduction in in stranded and super stranded patients during January, um, and I'm, obviously that will, we're planning that will continue into into the future months. Yeah. Good. Thank you. We also, at that point, I think, must acknowledge the um, the huge amount of work that our partners have done within the system. Um, so social care, especially, and um, NHFT have put additional capacity in place to help us, um, and that will have had a significant effect on our super stranded patients in the organisation. So we're doing the right things for our patients. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Bola, are you happy to carry on with um, with finance, please? Yes, thank you, Debbie. Um, I'm pleased to report that at the end of December, um, we're reporting a small year-to-date surplus of 27,000. Um, you will recall that we submitted a 7 million deficit plan for the phase three reset plan. Um, so we've reported deficit position for the last two months. So it is, um, it is pleasing to see that we are reporting a little bit of surplus. Um, but what, what has brought this about is because as part of the region's support for the Northamptonshire system to achieve a break-even position for the rest of this financial year, we received non-recurrent funding support of 7.6 million, of which we've recognized 3.8 million in December. The other key items to note um, for this month is in relation to pay, um, staff costs increased 
a, a great deal in December because um, we've had to, we've needed temporary staffing to cover shifts due to sickness, self-isolation. And also we've had to make enhanced payments when required to encourage staff to fill, you know, on field shifts so we could ensure that we continue to maintain patient safety. In addition, in December, we've accrued about 1.4 million um, of annual leave accrual, which um, Mark may come on to talk more about later, as a result of our decision to encourage um, staff to carry forward any unused leave and just to be available for when we need them now. Um, our overall estimate is we are likely going to need another 1.9 million um, for the rest of the financial year. And we've highlighted that risk to NHSI. In terms of our capital schemes, we're making good progress against our underlying schemes. Um, year to date, we've spent 16.3 million and we've got a further commitment of 19.6 million against our 40.8 million plan. However, as we've previously reported, the key risk is the slippage relating to the ITU build, um, which has been caused by finding asbestos um, and removing those. And we now estimate the slippage to be in the region of 5.6 million into next financial year. Obviously, this creates you know, a big significant risk for our capital programs and we are exploring all possible escalation routes to ensure we receive the funding <clears throat> next year. Um, I believe Debbie has got a meeting later on this week to discuss with the NHSI Regional um, Finance Director. And lastly, I just wanted to mention that our cash balance remains healthy. However, probably not for too long more. Um, because NHSI have indicated that the one month advance block income we've received in the region of 30 million will be taken off us in March. So we'll be back to where we were pre-COVID um, period. But it's fair to say that whilst that may um, constitute, you know, uh, uh, have an impact on our cash flow, we will continue to manage and monitor it the same way we've done in the past. There. Thank you, David. Thanks, Bola. Um, David, is there anything that you'd like to comment from the committee on finance? Yeah, the the finance finance and performance committee met yesterday. Um, you know, I think Carl has articulated well mm. the performance side of things. We are certainly a hospital that's under extreme pressure, um, but it is tremendous to hear the news that's coming out of cancer that um, you know the numbers are looking pretty good. That there is really great work being done there, and that's very comforting to see. Uh, and we also heard that in the patient story, of course. So if it's a hospital under pressure operationally, thankfully it's not so much under pressure from the financial point of view. And, you know, that's thanks to Bola and her team and, and great work from the divisions in ensuring that we, we are going to meet the targets we're, that, we're, that, that we're, were set, um, in the reset in the reset forecast. A um, number of other highlights I think I'd just like to mention, which we discussed at the committee. One is to do with the states. I mean, Stuart and his team really are doing a tremendous amount of work out there. And anyone... I suppose there aren't too many people who've actually been on the estate recently. I, I, I was privileged to be able to visit before Christmas. And there is a tremendous amount of work being done on the paediatric A&E, which is just about to be finished. Uh, work being done on the new front entrance, work being done on the new intensive care unit. Uh, really great to see. Uh, thank you very much, Stuart, and thank you to all your staff who are doing that. So good news indeed. Um, I think that's about all I want to say from the Finance and Performance Committee, Debbie. Yeah, thank you, David. OK, I'm going to hand over now to Mark to talk through our people. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Debbie. And um, <clears throat> quite a lot's already been said today about our people and, and, and the, the pressure, the immense pressure that people have been working under um, and coping with over this recent period of time. I just wanted to uh, make a couple of points and, and, and similarly to colleagues, I'll, I'll take a majority of the port of red, not that that underplays any of the fantastic work that's been undertaken there, um, but we did all just, all wait, also discuss it in quite a lot of detail at our people committee earlier this week in terms of things that we are doing and, and it's pleasing to see. Just pulling out some exceptions, we have um, 
we have heard as we have in, in relation to our people position and there are a number of actions that we're taking so it's important that we recognize how people are feeling and then make sure we respond appropriately with the appropriate action so one of them uh Vola's just spoken around in terms of annual leave and and the cost provision around that we want to ensure as an organization it's really important to us that people haven't lost um, any of their annual leave entitlement during the course of this year uh, where we've asked them to go above and beyond um, in terms of being able to work with us and, and, and maintain safety However, it is really important that people take leave. So, so whilst we are enabling a carryover provision of our annual leave, we've also mandated a specific amount of leave be undertaken because one of the most important factors is that people have rest um, and have the ability to um, just to rest before they, um, they come back into the workplace. So that's really important. So we've made, we've made that decision in relation to um, a statutory take in terms of what people have to take, a carryover position. And then from a financial perspective, because in listening to staff, there was a case of it's all well and Good to have lots of leave that I may not ever be able to take so could I be paid for it instead and, and, and we've um, we've assisted in, in that response too and, and, have, and have, have taken some action around it. We've also taken action in, in, in some of the more hygiene factors scenario in terms of the additional um, hot food provision which will now continue to the end of the financial year so to the end of March which is fantastic. And we've enhanced our psychological support for staff too. Um, we have, uh, as has already been described this morning, that we have a number of staff who um, are showing signs of needing some support in this area. And, and we're trying to respond to that as best we possibly can. Uh, that is within our organisation. That is also in partnership with other organisations, such as our colleagues in NHFT and in across the system within the county, whilst also using the national um, services that are available to us too. Uh, that's very, very, very important to us at the moment because as has been said, we are seeing people um, showing signs of um, um, uh, distress is not that it doesn't necessarily do it justice, but signs, signs of concern that we, we need to um, support them with. We have, um, in terms of our sickness absence position that you will see in the reports, we have seen an increase as, you know, it's, it's the winter and, and we've also had COVID and our staff are, are not immune to the infection rates or the high prevalence of infection rates that have been seen in and around the country. And therefore abs absence has increased during December and January. And as Bola has reported upon, that's, that's necessitated in us um, a, a request an additional temporary staff to support us during this period of time. Um, we continue to have a fantastic testing service to make sure that if people are symptomatic particularly of COVID then we can test them for it um, but also the thing that I would just take this opportunity and this platform to do whilst we're here today is just encourage all and any of our staff to receive the vaccination so we're going to come on to that report I know later but it's just really important to make sure we say to all of our staff every staff group every every background every gender every ethnic background to take that vaccination opportunity at the earliest possible opportunity um, it would be fantastic if you could um, you can see uh, during this period of time we've uh, managed to reduce our vacancy rates that is also borne by the fact that there's been some fantastic work overseas of international nurse recruitment and also our turnover has reduced during this period of time and finally just to summarize the the one thing that is really important for us to do is to deal with the here and now of course and provide that element of support but which has already been alluded to we have to look forward to the future and our people plan is in draft that we will be sharing in our private section of our board meeting um, this afternoon and it will be available um, in the public board meeting in March I'm happy to stop there and take any questions. Thanks, Mark. And um, is there anything that you'd like to um, to highlight from the committee? Um, no, I think uh, Mark's done a very good job already. Um, I think, yeah, health and, and wellbeing was a key focus, of course, and um, really thanking the team, you know, Mark's team, for the tremendous support they're putting in place, and particularly additional psychological support for our staff. So that was very reassuring. Um, we were pleased to hear that there's high retention levels amongst our international um, recruits, so, so that's good. Um, and the main focus of our joint people um, committee with Kettering and Northampton uh, was the people plan. So we had an opportunity to go through that people plan, which was co-created by our staff. Um, and we had the opportunity to input into that. And the response from the committee was very, very positive. And again, just acknowledgement to the team and the, and the efforts that have gone into um, putting this, uh, pulling this together. Um, so that's all I had to say in terms of additional uh, highlights. Thank you. Thanks, Anne. So I think we've got some hands up, um, Rachel. 
Yeah, hi. Question for Mark. Um, I think it's fantastic that the vacancy rate is, is coming down. It looks almost like a trend now, which is good news. Um, is going forward part of our strategy to continue recruiting from overseas? And if so, do you think it's going to be affected by, I guess, a number of factors, Brexit, the, the limits on travel at the moment? Is it less likely for people to want to come here? Thank you, Rachel. I was just trying to unmute myself. So, um, yes, we will continue with international nurses. So um, across our entire um, health and social care system, we have mm -hmm. received a, a further pool of funding to continue with international nurse recruitment. And we monitor that in our system people board. And Sharon is indeed the, um, the, the group chair around the international nurse program, which puts us obviously in a fantastic place, along with our colleagues from Kettering, to um, receive those additional nurses. So in the short to medium term, yes. Um, Brexit, no, I don't see Brexit having too much of an impact on the international nurse recruit program because we generally recruit those colleagues from outside of the eu um, the travel situation would be would could be our rate limiting step in terms of the um, where where and when and how borders are opened and, and how people can travel between uh, one place and another uh, but in the in the short to medium term we would indeed see that as our continuous pipeline of, of recruitment however in the medium to longer term uh, we're also looking at our national supply so we have uh, a system workforce cell that meets every week and of course our, our system people board where the University of Northampton particularly are very much involved and active partners in that where we're looking at the flow because one of the things that the pandemic has caused obviously is the student learning um, to be prevented in some way shape or form and we need to make sure we provide as much support to our students as we can and indeed to our university to enable those colleagues to qualify at the requisite period in time to then able to come into our workforce so we, we, we're sort of working on two streams but yes at the moment international recruitment will continue but we're also um, continually focusing on our national recruitment supply too. Thank you. Jill? Thank you. I, I just wanted to ask Mark about um, mandatory training. So this is probably an impossible question to answer because we've, we've spoken endlessly about pressure on the hospital and, and actually how well our staff are doing despite it. We've got an aggr aggregate here of mandatory training um, which, which obviously isn't at the level that, that we would like to see. But, but I'm wondering about whether we can, this is, this is why it's an impossible question, how can you prioritise mandatory training? Because um, but by the nature of the word mandatory, it's necessary um, to be undertaken. But there's particular areas that I know that we've always been concerned about. So, um, for example, level three safeguarding, safeguarding children. Um, need to make absolutely certain that our clinicians are on top of what they need to do and what they need to identify. Uh, th there must be a list of things that absolutely are top of the list, whereas I know the whole of mandatory training is necessary. So I just wondered whether we were in a position to be able to do something about those hot spots, if you like, on, on, the, on the training list. Thank you, Jill, and, and thank you for acknowledging it's an impossible question because they, uh, all of our uh, 10 core subjects are indeed statutory or mandatory training and therefore need to be undertaken. Uh, what we could do in the people committee for our next meeting is, is to bring a further breakdown. So we can take a breakdown of all of the training components because you're right, we get an aggregate score of just over 85%, slightly above overall target. But that could show that some places are in 60 and some places are at 95. So what we can do is give a further breakdown um, to provide some of that assurance to colleagues in relation to where each of those modules are. They have predominantly all been moved into e-learning, as you can see from the report, to try and encourage and, and, and enable people to undertake that training uh, specifically. But we are also in that catch-22 situation whereby finding the time for colleagues to undertake it in the last couple of months has been extremely challenging. Um, but it's important, as I said, in terms of us not just to, as a board not to just look at the here and now but to look at the future and, and, and in terms of increasing that provision that we may need to um, give to colleagues in order to get back to a, a higher loftier position across all of those disciplines so so we can bring that breakdown to the next um, committee and indeed to the board if you wish in March. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Andy? Hi thank you. Um, so Mark on the vein of impossible questions um, so see that the uh, the training rate has gone down and appraisal rate has gone down. I wondered if you could share which of those you think us as a board should be more concerned about. And then the second question was, in, in relation to Jill's really, a broader question, does this give us a sort of natural opportunity to assess which aspects of training are actually impactful? So there's some things that have not been done, 
that may not necessarily have been having a direct oper operational impact. And so I um, wondered if that gives an opportunity in this very tricky situation. Yeah, well, I'm loving these impossible questions this morning. So, so um, in terms of which is more important, they're both, of course, I'm going to say equally important. Um, if nothing else, but from the appraisal perspective, it's also an opportunity for us to check in with colleagues to see how they are and where they're progressing. It's not all around objective setting and target delivery, uh, which is ever so important. However, um, it, you know, it's been very difficult to have um, the the in-depth appraisal conversation that we we would normally request of colleagues in this current time which is the introduction of an appraisal light process that we brought in uh, around a month ago which has seen a slight uptick you'll see in the performance around appraisal completion because it's easier uh, it's not so um, cumbersome as a, as a document to complete because ultimately we're also looking at people's objectives and of course at the moment we uh, generally center in those around a, a couple of specific issues uh, which will change again actually after our final item around the ball priority and the group priorities later so we've we've tried to condense and simplify that appraisal process and, and almost as a check-in and how people are the other element that we have to recognize in the appraisal is normally we would then be looking at development opportunities for colleagues and where people would like to go next in terms of their own career development and at the moment a, a bit of that has been put on pause obviously for obvious reasons so so we're unable to um, suffice that demand as it's come through so we've put in an a, a appraisal light process which is hopefully helping people to to recognize that they are acknowledged and, and to see um, where they would like to be um, but acknowledging we're not perhaps not able to fulfill all of those requirements right now. From a statutory and mandatory training perspective, they're all really, really important. They are really, really important. There is not from a safeguarding perspective to a basic life support perspective to um, uh, they, they are all really, really important to ensure that they are undertaken a health and safety fire. We've discussed here as a board many a time. They, they are there as that, those 10 have been picked because they are the 10 key fundamental um, aspects, either from a statutory perspective or what we have deemed mandatory. So I haven't yet um, found any um, or any, had any suggestions as to which ones would be, um, could be removed uh, in that period of time. In fact, I've only had um, propositions around which ones should be included <laughs> to further increase the number of statutory mandatory training programs that we have across the organization. And again, just to pick another one out as an example in this particular time, infection control. So there really isn't, it's a real difficult rock and hard place choice to make in terms of what would you prioritize over fire, infection control, safeguarding, um, but basic, basic life support, they are all really, really important. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Chair. We'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Debbie. That was a very interesting and interactive debate around the, uh, the performance of the hospital at present. So thank you very much for that. We are running a little bit late, about 15 minutes late, in fact. So let's move on rapidly to the um, item number 10 on the agenda. I believe that's over to you, Carl. And it's on the reset and recovery phase three. Yeah, thank you, David. I will be very brief, uh, as many, much of this has been covered in the performance report. But just to say, um, the paper you have in front of you is our performance against the, the COVID phase three reset that was agreed in September. Uh, I'm pleased to say that um, this is fundamentally around elective and outpatient care uh, and, and the activity that we brought on post-COVID and all of the key metrics sit between 90 and 105% around our performance going forward. So again, as I've said previously, given the challenge we've had with COVID to deliver that sort of activity uh, against that backdrop is phenomenal uh, and the teams have done phenomenal well. I will say no more than that uh, other than take any questions. So, so, so questions for Carl on the reset. I, I, I suppose the good thing there, and there is a table there which is, gives a benchmark against, um, uh, give, gives a benchmark, and, and, and we don't appear to be outliers in, in, in any specific area. I, I believe I'm right in saying, Carl. Absolutely right, David. Uh... Of the, the, the table shows the 52 week position across the country, you know, so there are huge yeah, numbers of so, patients yeah. um, and we are not an outlier. There are some big numbers out there. I mean, none of us want any patients over 52 weeks, but given the situation with COVID, that has been an inevitable um, response. But every patient has a safety review um, that breaches 52 weeks um, and we are working to, to treat our longest waiting patients first as we work through our numbers. Yeah, that is 52 weeks, or greater than 52 weeks, as you say. Uh, and and, and you know, in terms of the reset in general, um, are we happy where we are? Can we, um, you know, I mean, this was all, this was all forecast with R equals one and R is 
a huge number greater than one, then we seem to be doing pretty well. Absolutely. I mean, this is it. It's credit to the teams. Uh, you know, the modelling um, has given us the numbers. We are delivering really, really well. Can we take our foot off the brake? Absolutely not. And we are certainly going to need the support of the independent sector in sourcing and outsourcing once the COVID numbers start to drop um, to try and regain our position to where, where we need to be. Uh, and that work is ongoing at the moment. Excellent. Thanks very much. Any questions for Carl on the reset? Uh, Rachel? Yeah, just a, a quick couple of points. Um, it was really nice to see that um, we managed to get Daintree up and running, having discussed it week after week at Reset. It was <laughs> one of those. Um, and the other one was, um, do you know what? I can't remember what I was going to say now. So come back to me. Come back to me, David. It's uh, fine. Uh, okay. Yeah. Andy, over to you. Where have you gone? I think you're muted, Andy. Um, yeah, I was just going to reinforce... Carl's message really is when when the, all this planning was done it was in September and we we're in very different circumstances and so you know to to look forward to where we are now none of us sat around that table imagined what it was so it is really a credit to everybody that uh, the numbers are, are, are where they are you know yeah, absolutely um, Rachel back to you no that moment's gone sorry there we go okay let me know if uh, it comes back <laughs> Okay, so that, 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 that's good news. The, um, the, the other interesting thing here was um, we, we, we appear to be doing really well in the context of virtual appointments, Carl. Where have you gone? There you go, up there. Yep. Um, but these virtual appointments tend to be for follow-ups rather than first appointments. Um, no, not necessarily. Um, as you see, you'll see from the, the, there is a breakdown that shows new and follow-ups, um, and yeah. we've had a major shift between um, face-to-face and non-face-to-face, which is absolutely the right thing to do, to use the technology that's available to us during uh, the, the COVID situation. And our teams have risen to that challenge and uh, have shifted that activity. Can't fault it. Excellent. Um, Mark, is that a hand I see up? Yes, thank you, David. It's just, it's just a really brief one, Carl, on the, um, on the appendix on page 78, is that we're a CRS trial site, and I just thought it might be worth saying what that is. You've got me, Mark. Which, which bit's on that? <laughs> so on the, um, on the appendix with the, uh, the RAG ratings at the bottom yes. here, we've got the second slide around the elective day pack around the referral to treatment weekend in the 13th of December 2020. And our cells in Coventry and Warwickshire are removed from the data there because it says we are a CRS trial site. That's in relation to RTT. Yeah. And the fact that we don't report Sorry, yeah. um, against the percentage, we now report in weeks rather we do. than as a percentage. Yeah. Okay. yeah, apologies, as you say, yes. Um, it, it, it's purely around, around length of stay and the, the, the weights to be seen, which again, as we're at 16 and a half weeks post-COVID, now down to nine and a half weeks. So we are meeting the target that was set us nationally. Cool, thank okay. you. Excellent, thank you very much, Carl. I, I have to say it's a challenge for my eyesight to read that particular slide, but there we go. Um, let's move on rapidly to the final item uh, on the agenda before we have a very brief break now, uh, and that's the Ockerden report. Um, and I will hand over to, uh, to Sharon, I can't see Sharon, there she is, um, to introduce uh, this item and present this item. Thank you, thank you very much, um, Chair, and I'm really pleased to be joined for this item by Owen Cooper, who's the Divisional Director for Women's and Children's, and Patricia Ryan, who's the Deputy Director of Midwifery. So um, I'm just going to give an overview of the paper, and colleagues will be happy to answer any questions um, that may arise. It's also worthwhile pointing out that we have discussed this, um, as, a, uh, as Jill has already said, in detail at um, our Quality Governance Committee. So just to put this in context for the board, the Ockenden report is a report that's derived from the significant concerns around maternity safety um, at Shrewsbury and Telford NHS Trust. And the then health secretary um, was reacted to the escalating concerns that were, um, that were being raised and asked that this review be undertaken. The review commenced that led to the publication of the Ockenden Report in December of last year. It's been published as a first iteration as, we've only, as there's only been 250 clinical reviews undertaken of the 1,862 concerns that have been raised overall around the standards of maternity care. 
what was really clear within the report and um, as the work um, progressed was that there were seven key themes highlighted associated with maternity safety um, that was felt would potentially affect national maternity services. So these seven key themes were classified as immediate and essential actions. All trusts that had maternity services were then asked to self-assess their position against the, imme the immediate and essential actions and they were asked to report to their board using the, the framework that we have used um, where our current status is. So we've done a gap analysis really. We then have to submit our paper at the end of February to the LMS and NHSEI to allow national comparisons to be made. The paper itself describes the trust position as January, looking at each of the immediate and essential actions, including the evidence that we, we can provide. Members of the board will note areas where we can provide levels of assurance, such as that we've reviewed our midwifery workforce needs in line with birth rate plus, and are currently recruiting to meet that shortfall, action two, as well as our maternity services having a good relationship with the Maternity Voices Partnership, and the fact that we're co-producing work together, action seven. There is of course areas where further work is needed, we need, to strengthen the, we need to strengthen the monitoring of fetal well-being through identifying a lead obstetrician with de designated responsibility, action six, and we need to ensure we develop more of an integrated governance approach both within the service and across the system, including the development of digital records as used by other maternity services, including KGH, action five. So this paper has been developed and shared and discussed within the division at the Maternity and Neonatal Safety Champions meeting, and as I've said, at most recently at QGC, and now obviously reporting to the Trust Board. On page 80 of, the, of our papers is a summary of, our, summary of the actions required to ensure compliance and assurance that we need to take forward. I would finally like to comment that as with action one, there's need for critical oversight of patient safety within maternity unit, units and that needs to be strengthened by increasing partnership across other trusts. And I'm pleased to share with the board that we're working closely with our colleagues at KGH and within the LMS in reviewing services and sharing the action needed to improve safety. And this can only grow, grow and be further developed. Are there any questions that the board would like to ask? questions. Uh, Anne, you have a question for Sharon. Hi, thanks Sharon. Yeah, no, very comprehensive um, response in the paper to the, um, the actions that we're undertaking. Um, one of the um, big issues with the Ockerton um, findings was the culture um, amongst the staff, uh, uncaring, lack of compassion. Um, and I wondered, is there anything that we're doing to make sure that we have that, that culture of compassionate care and kindness and uh, that we can avoid some of the lessons that, um, that we can learn from uh, the Ockenden findings. Chris, would you like, Owen, would you like to respond? I'm, sh I'm sure, to, well, I, I certainly can. Certainly from a, 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 a medical side, I think we are very much focused on multi-professional working. Um, I think we know that we had um, issues in the past, I think, with, with, with relationships. Um, and I have to say, I'm very pleased to say that things are, um, relationships are really good between all professional staff. But that, so that between obstetricians, midwives, neonatal team and anaesthetics, who are the key people that deliver services to the patients. So I, I, I think, although it's a very easy for me to say, um, I feel we're in a, in a quite a good position from that point of view. Um, I would um, welcome Trisha's view, but I think from the point of view of we have much, we do have good relationships with the midwifery colleagues. Um, we, in the past, we had issues regarding um, freedom to speak up. Um, and I think there were some issues that were tackled some time ago, um, but I think I do think we're in a, a much better place than we were before. Claire may be able to comment on that um, if she wishes. Um, but certainly from the point of view of that, that the cultural side of it, I think we're in a much better place than we were. And I think, com you know, comparing ourselves to other areas, I think we are in quite a good place, which we may wish to comment also. 
Yes, um, so I thank you. I'd like to come in. I'd like to say in terms of maternity services, there is a professional midwifery advocate's role and a strategy that supports the midwives on the floor and also supports the women and actually and, and supports the obstetricians and the MDT team. So in terms of that, we have a full MDT and that culture of support for the midwives on the floor and the obstetricians that therefore also holds the women we care for in the service because that's the research and the evidence to support that. In addition to that is the leadership to support those teams on the floor in terms of career mapping and developing them and aspiring them into different roles helps to untangle and promote a very positive relationships and culture within the service. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a couple more questions there. Uh, Denise, I saw your hand up first of all. Uh, yes, thanks, David. Uh, my question is really for uh, Jill and uh, QGC um, uh, members that obviously there is a lot of information in here, very full report. Um, what um, it was obviously discussed in, in more detail at QGC. What was the thinking there in terms of the scale of what we have to do here at NGH and also reassurance in terms of the action plan put in place? Who's going to take that one? Uh, Sharon? Yeah, I, I, I can start. So, so clearly we've been working on developing an action plan that underpins um, what the, uh, the, the scale of the, the ask actually is. Um, mm. And I think, well, I know that when we discussed, when we discussed it at, at QGC, there was certainly a degree of confidence in there that we have the ability to, to lift and take this forward. And that actually we've been doing a lot of work to date into improving um, and maintaining safety within the department. Certainly um, the work that we've done and the dialogue we're having with our partners at, at Kettering is also helping because we're bouncing ideas off each other there um, and sharing good practice. And that's also strengthened by the work of the LMS. Okay, thanks okay. Sharon. Chair? Thank you, move, move, moving on, thank you. Uh... Denise, moving on to Jill, I think, and then Claire. Um, thank you, Chair. So, so in response to Denise's question, um, I, I think we have a lot of confidence that uh, we can deliver against Ockenden. There are a number of areas, though, that we will need national support on. So um, we, we wait for national guidance. So, for example, um, uh, there's a, a role for a, a, an advocate, which is going to be, there's going to be guidance on that nationally and it will be recruited to, the post will be recruited to nationally. So there isn't a great deal we can do until um, we have that national guidance. Um, we've also got, um, we're working very closely with the LMNS and KGH on um, uh, a, a program of external reviews of uh, peer reviews of serious incidents. Uh, so uh, that's really positive, but we, um, we're reliant on, on uh, the coordination and the um, collaboration of, of our colleagues. All the actions that are internal are certainly deliverable. Uh, the reason that we thought it should go on the corporate risk register was because um, it's an absolute must do, as I said, in, in relation to clinical outcomes. Uh, but and also reputation, but I have you know a great deal of confidence that that can be delivered. I thought it was a really good question about culture, and there was a couple of things I just wanted to say about that. One that um, there is a national um, maternity and neonatal safety improvement program, uh, which ran a culture survey across every uh, maternity and neonatal unit in the country over the previous three years. That's about to be repeated. So I think that would be a really good opportunity for us to um, compare where we are now to, to where we were. But um, I also, as the uh, board level maternity and neonatal safety champion, do a drop-in session um, every month, which I'm alternating between maternity and neonatal services. And I was very pleased when a locum registrar um, came to see me when I was in the maternity unit virtually um, uh, a couple of months ago. And, and he said he thought the, the culture in the unit was much better than other places he'd worked in. And particularly, um, so echoing what Owen said, the relationship between uh, medical and midwifery staff and how it was a truly multidisciplinary environment. So I hope that gives you a bit of assurance, but I do think we do need to apply this culture survey when, when it um, is made available to us. Excellent. Thank you very much, Jill. We'll take a question from Claire, then finally Simon, then we'll break. Yeah, so Claire. 
Just very briefly to come back to Owen's comment, if I may, regarding freedom to speak up, I just wanted to confirm, and you'll see the report later, the numbers of issues raised by midwives has reduced in quarter one and two. But I would caution against taking that as a, as a theme going forward because all um, contacts with Freedom to Speak Up have also reduced in quarter one and two because of the COVID outbreak. But we'll certainly keep an eye on it. Thank you, Claire. Simon, over to you. Thanks, um, David. So firstly, just like to um, thank um, Trish and Owen for their leadership in this place. Um, uh, we are here because, you know, um, not just in some of the um, more uh, uh, popularised cases that have been in the national headlines. We know that maternity services have been under pressure nationally now for quite some time. So it's right that we pay attention to it. And I just wanted firstly to uh, uh, extend an invitation for us to continue this conversation. I don't think this is the only time we should be talking about this um, in the year ahead. So we'll leave it to you um, uh, and Jill to think about when you want to come back and talk to us again. But I wanted to give you the final word, I suppose, either of you and to say um, things that we could do to help you. Um, so I'm, I'm just inviting you, uh, I suppose, to close this conversation by saying, are there some things that you would like us to, um, to know about where you think we could help you some more? I think that's you, Owen, the new treasure. Owen first. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks, Simon. I mean, I think um, what I would like to say is that a lot of the stuff that we've started, we sort of started before this. So it's quite good that we were being proactive and certainly stuff with the recruitment, the maternity hubs and continuity of care. That support has been very welcome. I think we've, I think really we need to try and continue that with, regard, with regards of sort of um, where we need staff to fill certain roles to try and streamline that process. And I think, I, and I know Andy um, is sort of cited on the whole Medway issue, but there, there's a real challenge to move that forward in, 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 the, in the coming months um, to really embrace the changes that are going to need to occur to, to, to really transform the way we work, especially given the sort of um, the fact that we need to do quite a lot remotely and actually t tying everything together. But I think it's sort of just, you know, I have to say Trish has Trish started at the beginning of COVID. Um, she first came in when we were just beginning the lockdown of the, in the first wave and I think has really been able to draw everyone together and I think it's sort of we've identified where our gaps are and we really just sort of you know help us deliver those gaps and at, at the moment we know obviously the finances is, is not straightforward um, but uh, recognizing that you know maternity carries on regardless and the cost of getting it wrong to the to as a, on a personal level for patients and staff but also from a health economic point of view are considerable so the system costs of getting this wrong are really quite significant so yes just welcome your support to continue that thank you oh and last words to you then uh, treasure yeah, and just to say, I echo everything that Owen has said in terms of progressing the service in line with the investments to take it forward. And because those roles are key to safety, they're key to safety for it to safeguard the staff and the, and the women in our care. So it's the investment behind the recommendations. Welcome that. Great. Thank you very much, um, Owen. Thank you, uh, Tricia. And thank you, Sharon. Um, you know, matern maternity is always extremely visible in the community. It's, it's you know, there's A&E and, and maternity, and these, these are the two services which continually get mentioned. So from the point of view of maternity, it's really great to see the, the good work that, that you all are doing. So thank you very, very much for, um, for giving us your insights. Okay, and thank you, Sharon. And that ends the, the first part. Uh, we are running about 12 minutes late, so we'll have a five minute break. So if everyone could be back at 11.15, is that okay? Yep, it's time Thank for the kettle, I think. I'll go yep. back to being on call. Thank you.
think everyone's rejoining. Okay, I think people are beginning to click in after the short break. So just give it 15 seconds more in case people's clocks are not set accurately. Thank you very much for forwarding those backgrounds, Debbie, or whoever forwarded them. I'll, tr I'll try and put mine on during uh, Matt's presentation on uh, COVID-19 vaccination update. <laughs> John's already put his on very quick. It's easy. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Now I'll try and get mine done immediately. Okay, so I think most of us are here. Uh, let's commence the second session. Uh, this should take us up to, um, to 12.30, uh, when we will have another break uh, prior to the private uh, board session. So we're starting item 12 on the agenda, and this is the COVID-19 vaccination update. And I believe... We're now handing over to you, uh, Mr. Metcalf. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so I will take the paper as read and therefore simply take this opportunity to highlight some more recent updates. Um, so our, the and they, they are good news. Um, so our current numbers of patients vaccinated in the county is over 87,000 now um, and NGH having been in the first wave of hospital hubs back at the beginning of December, um, remains the single largest vaccinator with over 11,000 vaccines delivered to date. Um, as, a, as a county, we're doing really pretty well as a system um, in terms of the high-risk cohorts that we are vaccinating. We've now over 85% of our 80 plus year old patients vaccinated. Um, two thirds of care home residents and even though um, we were only um, given permission to vaccinate the over 75s last week, we've reached two thirds of those now also. Um, further good news is that as of this week, the vaccination centre at Moulton Park, central in the county as per the, per the paper, um, has opened and is delivering the AstraZeneca vaccine which allows us to further accelerate our rate of delivery in the county and it also allows us to start delivering um, vaccinations to um, frail and high risk inpatients without the need to bring them back onto the hospital site for their second dose which is going to be commencing imminently. There is nothing, nothing else that I particularly needed to say. I'm really happy to take any questions. So questions for Matt on the vaccination programme. Denise, your hand is up, although I can't see you. Denise, I think it must be an old hand. Mark, your hand is up. Thank you, David. Yes. <clears throat> Not necessarily a question for Matt, just to add uh, a couple of comments in terms of, as, as the report articulates, uh, NGH are the lead employer for the vaccination centre. And uh, it's just a huge testament to all of those people that have pulled that together. It's been a fantastic achievement um, and no mean feat to do that whilst also managing challenging acute care um, at the same time. So just a huge congratulations and thank you to people for doing that. Um, and it will serve our county well and hopefully we'll start to draw to an end the situation that we've all been facing over the last uh, well, near on a year. Excellent. Thank you very much. Matt, what, what, one, one question for me. I mean, one thing which has concerned um, staff who did get the first vaccination back in, um, in the back end of uh, 2020 um, and then had the gap widened for their, 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 their second dose. Do, do, what, what, what is your view, your clinical view on the, the efficacy of this particular change? Thank you. Um, so... The, the very succinct answer is that I fully support the change in policy. Um, I, um, in terms of population efficacy and therefore dealing with the huge pressures that um, the health service and we as, as a hospital within that are facing, the um, more widely we can protect the population and reduce the, the R8 and the chain transmission, 
um, the sooner we are going to get on top of um, COVID and make it a manageable burden of disease. Uh, in terms of individual efficacy, um, clearly we are do not have the same levels of evidence as we would if we had a vaccine that had been developed over many years, as is normally the case, and had um, taken the opportunity to play around with different uh, regimens and dosing and scheduling. However, um, I defer to the expertise of our immunologists and epidemiologists in uh, public health, um, who are pretty clear and consistent that we have high levels of protection after one dose, and I think that therefore the um, balance of risks has been well struck with the change of policy, um, and I wholeheartedly endorse it. Excellent. Thank you very much, Matt. Denise, your hand is up, but I believe it might be an old hand. It's an old hand. Okay, thank you very much. And question from you. Yes, thank you. Thanks. Um, my, I echo um, what's already been said about the, the amazing achievement on the vaccination front. This may be an impossible question to answer. However, I just wondered when you thought the hospital would see the benefits um, of this vaccination programme in terms of you know, reduced numbers of, for example, over 80s coming into the hospital. Um, when do you think we might see the positive impact of this? Yeah, really good question, Anne. Um, and of course, there's, there's the wishful thinking answer, which is as soon as possible, please. Um, and um, and then sort of, I suppose, drawing a little bit on some preliminary evidence. So we know that the vaccination program in Israel is, is the sort of the world leader. Um, and I accept that there's a significant extrapolation in terms of um, overall population health. Um, however, if their early results are to believe, then two weeks after a first dose of vaccination, they start to notice a significant drop in the prevalence of um, disease that's severe enough to bring people into hospital um, by about 30%. And it can, that decrease continues, but they are, because it is relatively new, um, the data for further out than um, four weeks after vaccination is um, treated with a degree of caution. But the short answer is that um, two weeks after a cohort is largely vaccinated, we should start to see a drop off in attendances if Israel's experience is to be replicated here, which means that, this means that in our case, that should be very soon. And indeed, there are some early signs, he said, with faith um, and hope that the, the pressures are beginning to ease ever so slightly. And are we factoring that into our modelling and, and, and planning? Was it too early really to do that? I don't think that you could extricate what we are seeing from the vaccine from what we are seeing from the lockdown. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Matt. For, for further questions for Matt? Just sorry, you might have mentioned this during your, your, your during your presentation, Matt. What proportion of our staff have had first dose already? Do we know that? Um, we do, um, and I have not got that figure jotted down to head. It is the majority of our staff. I see. I see Mark is waving. His, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so, so um, in terms of figures across the group, David, we're in we're in the region of 7,000 vaccines. Um, so across both Kettering and Northampton, which is just over 10,000 colleagues, so 7,000 so far. But as I said earlier, it's really, really important that we encourage all of our colleagues to come and undertake the vaccine. And we have seen, and I believe it's been in the national press colleagues, so such as from a BAME background, as an example, uh, appear to be more hesitant about receiving the um, vaccination. So uh, we'd very much like that to be 100% as soon as possible. Yeah, that was going to be my follow-up question was concerning the, the, the BAME community who, uh, who appear to be at higher risk than, 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 other, than other parts of um, are, are we focusing on the BAME community to try and get the message across? In, so in just to give an or... example of how we're trying to promote, how we are promoting this amongst our BAME community, um, on day one, the 8th of December, uh, we had a lot of publicity around our first three vaccine recipients, all of whom were senior BAME members of staff. Excellent. We, we, we're taking, uh, we have right from the beginning and continue to take effort, um, steps to promote it amongst our BAME colleagues. Yeah, and it, it just find it kind of concerns me that we're at 70%. Um, it's now sort of the end of January. 
Um, do you believe that that 70% is going to move closer to 100% if we haven't got the first jabs in by now? Are we going to get them in? When you factor into account those who are staff who are working from home or otherwise shielding and also that quite a few of our staff have chosen to receive their vaccinations um, through their GPs um, once they came online. I suspect that the true figure is a little bit higher than, than 70%. I don't know, Mark, if there's, I don't think at the moment we're able to break down other than through our occupational health departments, the quantum that have been have had their vaccinations through primary care. That's exactly right, Matt. So we're looking at that at the moment in terms of where people may have had the vaccine in other sources. However, we do know that <laughs> colleagues that colleagues haven't come forward for the vaccination for one reason or another. So we have to continue to work on uh, supporting those to do that. And it's been it's been a it has been challenging um, with the uh, first vaccination that was licensed uh, because it's a vaccine that needed people to come to a certain department and so on and so forth, as opposed to in the flu campaigns, for as an example, where we have people roving and, and are able to deliver where the where people are working. So that is a slight challenge um, from, from our current situation. Yeah, it would be good to know how that number does get closer to 100 over time. I, I get a funny feeling, David, will be required to report on it very, very, yeah. very, very frequently. So <laughs> you'll get to hear about it regularly, yeah. I'm sure. Okay. Yeah, just another thing to report. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, and thank you very much, Matt. Um, great, great work everyone is doing in, in, in terms of the vaccination update. Um, it's good to hear that Northampton's getting the news. Sorry, John, I see your hand is, is raised there. Very nice background as well. Well done. <laughs> okay. um, Matt, I know our, our vaccination centres have been... You're back to croaky. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Just about. Our vaccination centres at the hospital are due to close. Will we still be able to vaccinate patients? The question was that our, our vaccination, I think Billing Road is going to close for vaccinations, but are we still going to be able to vaccinate patients? Um, yes. John, I, in, not, in case the nuance of the question is lost, then please have to pick it up offline. But yes, it's a short answer to that question. Thank you very much. OK, if there are no further questions for Matt, once again, thank you very much. And let's move on to the next section of the agenda, which is governance. And item 13 is the uh, Freedom to Speak Up by Annual Report, uh, which will be presented by, uh, by Claire Campbell. Claire, over to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to point out this is the reports from quarters one and two, and you can see in the report that there is a decrease in cases noted in those two quarters. This was noted also regionally, but not nationally. We believe that that was because of the amount of additional communications that were put in place for our staff at the beginning of COVID, and also the fact that we did not suffer issues relating to PPE, which was noted in other organisations. Um, during this period of time, um, the Freedom Speak Up network has been very busy, the regional networks, and we've been supporting each other to, to maintain communications. And I've also been pleased that we've undertaken some um, training for five more values ambassadors, which includes staff members from our BAME network, which I'm really delighted about. I'm happy to take any questions. Questions for Claire? on the Freedom to Speak Up Biennial Report. No, I think everyone is extremely happy with the work you're doing in that area, Claire. So thank you very much for that. Uh, if there are no further questions, then we shall move on to item 14 of the, uh, the agenda. Uh, and we're staying with you, Claire, and, and this is on the Board Assurance Framework. Okay, thank you, David, again. Um, the, this is the quarter three report. It has been through all the board committees. Um, and just to note that two, two issues have been changed. You will note there's been an increase in the deadlines um, in response to the COVID sur surge. So that's the deadlines for actions being completed in some cases. And also all references to workforce committee have been changed to people committee. Currently, um, we are undertaking a review of the BAF um, in line with the update due after the end of quarter four, and all the execs are starting to get involved in that. 
and we're going to do a review and refresh, which will also include a review of the target scores, as we have discussed at many of the committees, um, and make sure that those are in line with ensuring these are achievable by the end of the next financial year, but with some stretch included, clearly. Also, um, just to go back to the comments made earlier regarding staff wellbeing, within um, the, the refresh, that will also be included in line with the uh, risk that's being added to the corporate risk register. Changes in score to the BAF in this quarter, risk 1.10, which is the uh, delivery of the recovery plan post COVID, we increased the score on that, noting the better news presented today in reset, but at the time of writing, we did not have that information. We have also increased the score on risk 3.1, which is about workforce capacity in relation to COVID. And we have decreased one of the scores, which is 5.3, which is the capital program risk because of the amount of funding we have received recently that the board will be aware of. I'm happy to take any questions. Questions in the board assurance framework. It is good to see that we're doing some work on uh, how we get from current scores to target scores as well. I think that's very important that the, uh, the board assurance framework has some sort of audit trail about what needs to be done to get to where we want to be, which it doesn't appear to at the moment. So that would be my only comment on the BAF. Any other questions for Claire? Okay, in which case we move on to item 15 on the agenda. It's the Joint People Committee Terms of Reference. And I think we're sticking with you, Claire. Thank you. Um, this is the third joint committee terms of reference we've brought to the board, the previous two being digital and quality, which you had at the last public board. Um, these were presented to the People Committee on Monday, and there has been one amendment to note that has been made subject further to that committee, just for the board to note, which is in section 7.8 where it says receive reports from the Freedom Speak Up Guardians, we are also going to add um, reports also from the Guardians of Safe Working to make sure that both trusts are in um, alignment with their reporting structures. We also had a conversation about section 10 and 10.1 in particular about effectiveness and monitoring effectiveness of the committee. And myself and my counterpart at Kettering Richard are going to have a further discussion on all terms of reference going forward to make sure we align that as well. But given that one small amendment for now, I just want to ask the board's approval for these terms of reference, noting that they will be iterative as this committee develops and moves and takes the work forward. I don't know if Mark wants to add anything. No, 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 not a huge amount more, Claire, as I say, they, they will change in line with the people plan when we um, um, take that to the board in March, but they won't, you know, it won't be dramatically changed. It will just be in terms of what we focus on in terms of our priorities. Thank you. So, so with that, um, I just ask for the board's approval of these terms of reference. Yep, yeah, I think you can take the terms and conditions of the Joint People Committee to be approved by the board. So thank you very much for that, Claire. Um, moving on to the final item under governance, and that is emergency preparedness annual report. And I believe, Carl, you are going to present that to the board. I am, Chair, um, to give Claire a break. Um, so I will take the annual report uh, as read, uh, and this is on the Trust Preparedness to Meet the Civil Contingencies Act uh, of 2004. Um, the paper reports on the training and exercising programmes that uh, and details the developments of the emergency planning arrangements in NGH for major incidents and business continuity. Uh, the paper also gives a summary of the instances where the Trust has had to respond to extraordinary circumstances. Um, the Trust is, fully rated, is rated fully compliant and has been for the last three years on the EPRR core standards assurance process. And uh, the board is asked to receive the report as a statement of assurance and preparedness to provide an effective response to a range of incidents uh, and emergencies. I've no more to say, but happy to pick up any questions. Questions for Carl on the emergency preparedness annual report. Um, just, just one for me. Um, does this include things like surge capacity for COVID-19 and so forth? It, 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 it will, absolutely. And part of the work that we're doing going forward with uh, surge capacity is um, as a hospital, we have met to review 
all the areas in the hospital uh, as to what areas should there be a major incident, what other areas could we use for bedded capacity, uh, and, and we're working for that as, as an addendum to the, the major incident policy uh, going forward. Okay. And from the point of estates, everything is covered there. We, 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 we don't have problems in terms of, um, well, we do have problems in terms of generator capacity at this moment in time, Stuart, correct? Although that is being addressed. That's correct, yeah. The, we've just invested just over seven million pounds in our electrical infrastructure this year which will complete at the end of March. So our generators will be uh, N plus one. So there'll be generator plus a generator back up to the generator. But, but we still have a level of risk until that happens at the end of March. Yeah, uh, we do. We've got temporary generators on site at the moment, so there is the capacity there. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Stuart. And thank you very much, Carl. If there are no further questions, Simon, yeah. sorry, your hand is up. Thanks, David. Um, so I think, um, although it's um, too soon to do this, um, clearly our EPR, our arrangements have been tested to the max over the last year. And some might say in simple terms, we've been in a permanent state of major incidents since about March last year, with maybe a couple of moments where it feels like it's died away a bit. I think it would be important that um, the report, I'm, from my point of view, is absolutely fine, but we ask the team, perhaps working with their counterparts in Kettering, to commission a specific piece of work, and we note that that's a requirement here on what are the lessons that we need to learn from this, because, or we, and we've touched on some of them, um, Sharon spoke earlier about some of the lessons we've learned about infection control and how we've had to adapt um, our practices during the course of a pandemic. Um, some of the issues that we will learn no doubt will have to do with our buildings and the fact that our wards are too cramped in some cases to deal with some of the issues that we are facing. So I'm suggesting I suppose that in supporting and accepting this report we also quite deliberately commission fairly early on as wave two recedes a piece of lessons learned work across the group and that we um, set ourselves the task of, of doing that and then debating it because it's quite likely um, and if we were taking a bet on this that we're going to be facing some form of Covid outbreak whether it's pandemic or uh, not will, will remains to be seen next winter and we could do I think with having really thought through what we have learned and making sure that we have done all that we can do to improve on the responses, great though they are, that we've already made. Yeah, good point. Thank you very much, Simon. Uh, Carl, your hand is up. Yeah, just to respond to Simon, absolutely. Um, we did a full uh, lessons learned from the first phase of COVID-1, um, both with ourselves, our colleagues at Kettering and with the CCG. And I'll certainly pick that, that going up from phase two as well and, and feed that in. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Carl. If there are no further questions, let's move on to the uh, final section of the agenda, which is the really interesting section of the agenda, which uh, addresses um, strategy. And the, the first item there is um, the strategic cancer plan, which we've mentioned on a number of occasions during the course of this particular meeting. So over to you, uh, Mr. Metcalf, to introduce this, I believe. Thank you, Chair. Um, so uh, we've already heard a fair amount around cancer and the, the theme has been a priority for the organisation and therefore an appropriate theme for this board meeting. Um, and um, the from a clinical leadership point of view, uh, Mr. Hemant Namade has been the lead of uh, the Clinical Lead for Cancer Services at NGH for a couple of years and is now one of my deputy medical directors, and he's going to take you through um, where we've been and what we're doing and how we're going to approach cancer in the future. Hemant, welcome. Thank you, Matt, and uh, thank you, uh, Chair and the board, uh, for having me today. Uh, uh, right at the outset, I wish to thank uh, Colin and extend my gratitude towards uh, from from the entire cancer team at NGH uh, for the feedback because feedback is what drives us forward. Next slide, please. So today I, I wish to address four issues. The first 
at the, uh, I would like to lay down a vision for our group uh, for improving the cancer services in the county. I would highlight our response to COVID-19 basically because there are a lot of learnings uh, from there which uh, we can take long term. Then highlight our transformation plan, which is a short to medium term plan for cancer services at Northampton. And last but not the least, uh, the most important uh, is uh, to highlight the key pillars, uh, what we should keep uh, in perspective while developing a group cancer strategy. Thank you. Next slide, please. So as a group uh, 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 of cancer clinicians across the county, we interact quite a lot. And it is very clear that it is our ambition and determination to deliver step change in the outcomes which matter most to our patients in society. And, 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 and this ambition of our group cancer strategy uh, uh, links nicely to the trust group ambition of dedicated to excellence. However, from cancer perspective, I wish to add further, our ambition should be must do, can't fail when it comes to cancer services. Next slide, please. At the heart of our uh, uh, vision uh, for, is, is for what cancer patients should expect from a county cancer service based on these six strategic ambitious priorities, which we need to develop and deliver over the next four years. I will elaborate on some of these in the later part of my presentation. However, the success of our work will only be demonstrated if as a group and as, 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 uh, uh, as group university hospitals, we achieve top five national status, not only in the performance indicators, but most important is patient experience service and uh, uh, educational and research portfolio for cancer. Next slide, please. The, emo the emergence of COVID-19 as a pandemic in the first half of 2020 has had, a, has had an immediate and dramatic impact on cancer care, not only in Northampton, nationally, but one where we learned a lot to ensure that the cancer patients in Northampton get timely, appropriate care, we put in a place a mechanism, an internal mechanism with a dedicated cancer cell with support from the executives. We work uh, uh, closely with the internal teams regionally and locally in a networked approach. The aim of the networked approach was to ensure that we are able to deliver as much care and treatment as possible for our patients at Northampton, and we had an excellent relation with our independent sector. Next slide, please. Like all avenues, COVID-19 crisis has made us rethink care, and some of the changes might be in long term. And, and these are positive effects. For example, minimizing hospital visits, face-to-face -face consultations, and delivering care through telemedicine. Throughout the last year, in addition uh, to safety netting, governance, and delivery, what we really uh, embarked on an exciting journey of designing and piloting innovative diagnostic models, particularly in urology, colorectal, lung, dermatology, personalized care, and ambulatory care. And based the, the basic principles of these new pathways was immediate access, timely diagnostic within seven days and straight to test. And most important is one-stop diagnostics to minimize the patient visits. These pilots have been evaluated. They have been proved successful. And we are now in a process of rolling that across other tumor uh, sites. In addition to this, we participated in two national projects and we continued the research trials at Northampton within the safety of, uh, 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 of, of the clinical nature of the trials. Next slide, please. Next, please. We have talked about performance a lot and uh, the board is quite well cited on that. The reason I'm bringing this here is to, is to explore the learnings from this. Now, if you look at the two week with referrals which we received in the first pandemic, as per the national uh, picture, our referrals went down. We picked up our referrals somewhere in August, uh, 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 mid-August to pre-COVID levels. And uh, uh, it, we have seen a slight dip end of uh, December and first week of January. But the real uh, 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 performance figures do not talk the, the cohort of patients which do not uh, 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 which did not come through this pathway. We had 20% rise from June till December in patients presenting 
with through emergency uh, emergency care pathways next please as you can see from from july and august we continued an upward trajectory for recovering our two week wait uh, 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 performance and from october we have met the standards and we continue to meet uh, continue to meet this uh, two week wait referral standards next slide please and this is the key element of the performance is the faster diagnostic standards northampton general hospital was one of the 10 hospitals which participated in piloting this uh, faster diagnostic standard in 2019 and it it came into force in the pandemic in april and all our efforts from the from the pathway efficiencies the one stop model and straight to diagnostics have actually yielded Uh, uh, results, as you can see, that throughout uh, post-pandemic, from July to mid-August, we have maintained uh, uh, our uh, faster diagnostics national standards of 75 percent. What it really means is, is, is a patient who is referred on for cancer diagnostics or suspicion of cancer gets a diagnosis through all the tests before 28 days, either of no cancer or can or or has cancer. and this reduces a lot of anxiety uh, uh, and and leads to better quality of experience for the patient our ambition for a group should be that we should aim towards achieving 95% uh, which is easily uh, possible because what covid has taught that if we have joint efforts in a network approach we can achieve things next slide please Oh, this is a this is a very important slide uh, uh, where you can see our 62 day performance has shown uh, upward trajectory from august uh, and uh, as expected uh, in january we are expecting slightly a dip in our performance because of covid related shielding of patients but this is not validated to expand on the question which richard asked debbie uh, about our performance and how we compare regionally i think that's very important regionally in east midlands we are in the top 3 we are well above the average of 74% nationally we are just below the average of by 0.2% in terms of 62 day performance but i admit there is much more we can do to improve it consistently and in long run but the slide below is some thing which really heartens me and 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 it it is really an effort uh, throughout the organization if you look at uh, on the left hand side we had approximately 100 uh, um, legacy in february and january last year and that is that was consistent across legacy are those patients who are waiting beyond 64 days for any cancer treatment or diagnosis uh, uh, as expected it peaked in uh, during the pandemic but what we have seen is this throughout the pandemic we have maintained and with close monitoring and we have reduced our legacy as of today's 46 of which the true legacy is only 20 uh, and 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 the aim should be this legacy should be as close to zero as possible and that is what uh, we should be aiming as a group uh, towards next slide please so in conclusion there was there are a lot of learnings there are a lot of positives from the covid 19 So in October uh, last year, uh, as a part of our transformation and reset uh, board, we thought let's channelize this. So we started on a ambitious program of a transformation and delivery plan for one year, focusing on three key elements uh, of uh, of the cancer pathways. Next slide, please. so this this is what we 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 wanted to do we have now set the foundations of our plan uh, and focusing on three interdependent areas outpatients diagnostic capacity and delivery and last is digital tools to help manage this the reason for that is our complete focus and priority is to recover our 62 days recover uh, 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 and maintain our two week waits post this second wave and continue to maintain our faster diagnosis standards because earlier we diagnose better it is uh, uh, for for patient experience earlier the treatments better it is for uh, uh, survival and quality of life for post treatment next slide please so this is uh, this is a very busy slide uh, but in a nutshell uh, i would like to uh, uh, say that we have completed a, a accurate capacity demand and capacity modeling for outpatients across all 13 tumor sites what we have done is uh, diagnostic and capacity modeling in endoscopy and what our aim is clinical triage of any referrals with risk stratification within 3 days of uh, receipt of referrals 
outpatient appointment in a one-stop setting or a, a diagnostic straight to test within seven days and to achieve a diagnosis within 21 days. These are quite ambitious targets. Now, as of uh, December, we were at 60% across all the tumor sites. Some tumor sites like urology, we were at 90%. Some tumor sites, because of complexity and traditional pathways, we were not that, uh, uh, achieving a uh, high percent. But our aim should be that 60% to move at least in 80, 90%. And these are very small and specific uh, uh, steps, but they will have significant changes. Just to give an example about the digitization, what we are working on is a digital tool for managing the uh, uh, patient pathway, have alerts at, at levels. And what over the last three months with a transformation team, we have mapped our urology pathway around iBox. The aim is, uh, is, to, uh, is to work in short term on whatever IT solutions we have at this point, we can, whether we can tweak it with very little resource implications financially and use it in short term till we have the system C, shared clinical records and the digital strategy for the group implemented. Next slide, please. So this is just to give an example of our pathways and these are the major steps in our cancer pathways. What we are trying to do is the successes of the different pathways around urology, lung, colorectal, what we have noticed, which has led to a better performance in terms of faster diagnosis standards. Now we are extrapolating this to other uh, areas, other clinical pathways, and we expect this work to be done uh, by the, in the next six months because this is the key, mapping the pathway and faster diagnosis. Next slide, please. So these are the uh, timelines which align with the overall timelines of the clinical strategy uh, where the group cancer clinical strategy will be, will be an integral part. I have to say and admit uh, that this, uh, the second wave uh, has put some spanners in it. Uh, there are significant challenges in terms of the tired workforce uh, and, and, and funding around, around implementation of certain pathways. However, internally as an organization with executive support, we are trying as much as we can to stick to these timelines. Next slide, please. Finally, the last and the most important part of my presentation is to give an overview around development of countywide unified cancer strategy. What we really need to have a holistic wraparound cancer care for the county, which is self-sufficient. Uh, and this will form a key pillar of our group clinical strategy, interlinking well with the academic, research, digital, workforce, nursing, and estates uh, strategy. Next slide, please. Now, one might argue this is in the domain of a public health England. However, uh, uh, from, from long-term point of view, our group cancer services should be based on a basic foundation to shift the focus from treatment diagnosis to, to prevention. And the reason for that is every two minutes, someone in England will be told they have cancer. And if you look at the projection models, half of the people born from 1960 will be diagnosed with cancer in their lifetime by 2030. Reassuringly, our survival figures and, and the rate of mortality is, is, has gone down over the last 15 years. But what it means is that we have a huge cohort of people living with and beyond cancer to care for. And, and this will be a huge demand on, on our health services in 10 to 20 years. So if we really have to be ambitious, I think we should have a concerted efforts across the system for prevention. And uh, uh, the, uh, the, the final point I would like to make is, 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 that, is that we shouldn't see this uh, uh, as, as in silos and, and have a proper comprehensive strategy. Next slide, please. Now, what is the local context? Do we really need to change? You know, why do we need to go through this reconfiguration? And the answer is definitely yes. As a group, NGH and KGH performance, both in patient experience always, and, and as well as our performance always has been lower uh, uh, of the upper core time. And this has obviously been affected before the COVID, but I'm, I'm saying this on basis of the data before COVID. Now, NGH has been slightly inconsistent uh, uh, and there are several multiple factors of, uh, for it. The first is uh, we have thrice number of referrals as Ketri. We have complex uh, referrals purely around oncology. 
we we have a uh, 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 workforce deficits uh, in certain areas and it is extremely important that that this or this this uh, should be considered when we develop the strategy the second element is if we consider the top four performance uh, poor performing tumor sites for both kgh and ngh three urology lung and upper gi we depend on organizations outside our remit outside our control and outside this county for delivery of their 62 day target and that is where uh, 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 we need to be self sufficient and be really ambitious and the current uh, uh, subgroups for the east midlands cancer alliance which have been uh, uh, planned post covid uh, lester kettering northampton have been clubbed together which is um, which amounts to 2.1 million of population and i think there's a real opportunity as a county to be ambitious and to be self sufficient for complete delivery right from the first till the end of the patient's journey next line please now certain principles and values uh, uh, will be extremely central to the context and successful implementation design and sustainability of of our county wide cancer services and and that and and that, that should be people with excellence compassion respect integrity accountability and innovation and a founding principle of our county wide cancer partnership should be to ensure that patients their families carers and the staff are at the heart at the decision making and collectively they will bring wide range of understanding experience knowledge as we saw colin's uh, uh, feedback to help us to develop and co-design this program of work in a collaborative fashion the strategy uh, uh, should be agile adaptable flexible for continuous uh, uh, improvement should be ambitious enough as i mentioned to be self sufficient uh, to provide for our county and the last but the most important uh, uh, of our strategy we depend on the national survey which is annual and i think the patient experience and quality metrics should be real time and should be embedded and should be considered at par with performance uh, metrics in in our county next line please now again uh, this is the most important uh, is 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 prevention uh, why i'm coming back to it again is purely because more uh, uh, than 4 in 10 cancers uh, 10 cases of cancer which we diagnose nationally are caused by aspects of lifestyle which are modifiable like smoking and obesity and and there is much more we can do as primary and secondary providers to influence by information dissemination and use every contact that counts especially in the teachable moment when they are referred on to the cancer pathway and and as i as i as i say there is much more we can uh, uh, do and there has to be a a, a, a system wide efforts uh, uh, for information dissemination as well as uh, uh, as well as ensuring that people take responsibility of their health and we change the social fabric into uh, into prevention rather than uh, treatment next slide please now the second most important pillar will be how do we influence uh, survival rates how do we influence uh, uh, this as a group better than what we are doing individually and i will start with screening northampton county's cervical screening just for an example is well below the national standard of 80% and 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 there is there is lot we can do to because these cervical cancers can be uh, uh, picked up at precancerous levels and uh, uh, can be they are potentially your preventing cancers and and we should have a county wide accountability framework with screening leadership for a joint up screening programs and second most important is early diagnosis i keep coming back to it because that's the key for uh, uh, for preventing morbidity mortality and improving quality of life now what covid has taught uh, is is that as a, as a as a strategy for the county we should have a hub and spoke model what i mean by that is in addition to standardization of the pathways having stratified pathways we should have a green dedicated elective covid site in the county for complex diagnostics treatment and what we should create is various sub hubs which can be based in primary care center we can develop educational programs for 
general practitioners with uh, uh, with uh, interest in cancer we should have community clinical nurse specialists as a part of our nursing strategy and this is how we reduce the burden on the acute sites and make faster diagnosis quicker we need to remember after uh, overall of all cancers under, of, of 100 patients who are referred only 15 will have cancer 85% will not have cancer i'm just talking about all the tumor sites so i believe this is extremely important now cancer rehabilitation is something is is very close to my heart uh, we have launched a pilot for prehab in colorectal and uh, this needs a uh, 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 really impetus in our cancer strategy because what really matters is the quality of life of the patients after they go back into community and last but not the least the the uh, the research and innovation i think this is extremely important if we really have to be in the top 5 in the country and to achieve world class standards because unless we achieve that we will not get international trials to our country next slide please this is the central uh, part of our strategy is patient's experience a cancer patient's experience is a fundamental indicator of quality of our health service from the point they start their journey they engage with the health service in primary care in screening to diagnosis to treatment the national cancer patient survey which comes annually uh, uh, gives a good insight however it doesn't go far enough it is retrospective to some extent i would say a big wake and what i explain uh, what i mentioned before is we need to develop additional real time patient experience metrics for the county which we, which we should embed and optimize within the accountability framework across organization across tumor sites and and this is more for learning and intelligent dissemination and linkage to performance and in addition to that we need to have patient advisory groups because we need to harness the energy of the patients communities to in, encompass their responsibilities to our health service and help us to actually shape our services in long term last but not the least as we move in short to medium term towards transition we need to ensure a uh, staff experience uh, as well in it uh, you know all the staff have worked hard when any, any transition is difficult for any one of us and i think we need to be very mindful about how we engage when we uh, 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 deliver uh, or or design this strategy next slide please the last and the most important part of our uh, our strategy is obviously operational uh, effectiveness efficiency which has got multiple areas to look at workforce quality assessment digitalization everything the reason why this is important is because cancer pathway is complex with a mix of cancer types a constantly evolving evidence base and engagement across a number of services from primary to tertiary care but what our group will be able to do is to drive system performance by supporting individual partners whether it's primary care or secondary care with specific operational workforce issues by sharing best pack by best practice and by most important flexing demand and capacity between organizations what we learned from our association with independent sector just to give a perspective and expand on this uh, during the first wave we conducted 600 uh, uh, diagnostics and surgical treatments and oncology treatments from three sites we were the first in the county and i still remember 24th march tuesday was our first list we were the first in east midlands to activate our partnership with them and i think that's the key to flex capacity now obviously this will remain as a part of our strategy what we really need to do is to is 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 to standardize the protocols across the county accurate capacity modeling is very important and applying best practice while we uh, 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 share our precious resources and capabilities and and this will never happen unless we have real time cancer intelligence and and, and and that's the key the informatics and data uh, is is the key for influencing performance and care in real time and and that's what we saw in 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 covid information was the key next line please i've just put this slide uh, 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 just uh, just from the learning in covid what we learned is that uh, 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 and and from my personal perspective and and, and all my team uh, here is that before covid for implementing anything we had so many layers of governance level layers of bureaucracy 
And as a group cancer strategy, we should have a unified governance operational framework, uh, 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 which will help us to deliver a unified uh, uh, pathway, which is equitable across all the tumor sites. And, 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 and I think I've just, I've just put some uh, uh, layers you know, for developing is that it should be a bottom to top approach with the workforce, you know, tumor site leads from the county coming together, putting their ideas together. And I'm sure, and I know that this is a part of, of uh, uh, Matt's and Karen's uh, plan going forward. Next slide, please. So to conclude, uh, 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 I have given an overview uh, of the group cancer strategy. One might argue this doesn't go into specifics, but I do not want to preempt purely because we have a work program coming up for the clinical strategy. However, I would wish to say that through clear and collective leadership, our cancer, a county-wide cancer group will generate value greater than some of its parts and efficiencies will be realized both locally and system-wide. Over the next few years, for us to, uh, to develop, implement, innovate, and sustain, we will need four key areas. One, promoting a culture of safety and quality. Second is professional leadership. Third is operational effectiveness with flexibility in the system. Strategic planning, which is not only transformational, but sustainable in long run. For all of us involved in this ecstatic journey, this is a challenge. I admit and I agree. However, keeping into perspective the level of satisfaction if we really achieve this ambition, this is, this is an enormous opportunity to improve the health services for our county, particularly for cancer for a generation and leave our lasting legacy. Thank you. Okay, Matt, are you going to add to that? Um, and, and to be honest, Chair, no, I think that was a, a very comprehensive overview of the plan. I'd rather allow it at time for debate. Yeah, I have to say it was a very, very interesting presentation. And thank you very much, Emin. Um Really, very, very, yeah, you've done a lot of work on that. And, you know, it's great to see what's happening at the moment. It's great to see that there is a, a strategy there to develop cancer as we move forward. Um, Andy, I see your hand is up. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> yeah, a really great presentation. Thank you. Really encouraging to see the, the ambition there. Um, just adding my support for the, the digital tools. I, I think I'd echo what you said around the position we have at the minute is a collection of tools which don't talk to each other that you know, really don't give you the information that you need. So um, I know we've been talking about it uh, through email, but I'd uh, just like to, to note that uh, that you've, you have my full support. Thank you, Andy. Um, we've got questions from Denise, Tom and Rachel. Denise, we'll start with you. Okay, thanks, David. Uh, mine's more an observation and less of a question, I guess. Um, yeah, both very well thought through um, strategy there, really interesting and ambitious. Um, and I think from a strategic point of view, the things that we were hearing there really tie in closely with the other work that we're doing on the ICS side of things. So there were a number of bells ringing there in terms of um, the successful ICS across the world have really focused on this prevention side of things. So that's a really key thread for, um, for us, I think. And also this concept of hubs and subhubs reflect the way that the um, ICS is likely to be developing. So um, as I say, there was a lot there that resonated with me and really interesting from a strategic point of view. So thanks very much. Thank you, Denise. Tom, Thank over you. to you. Yeah, I, th I think more of the same. Hemant, an excellent presentation. Thank you. And I, I think really very, very excited by the ambition of the strategy and, and, and the opportunity to use the group model to deliver it and putting patients clearly at um, front and centre with real time feedback. I think that's really important and, and a close observation of metrics to show that we're delivering what we should. And, and, and I would say this, but, but also, you know, making sure that we're up to date by engaging in research. And, and I, I know you want to do all of those things. Um, just one question, and I hope I know the answer, but I'm going to put Simon on the spot. Um, on one your timetable, you mentioned confirmed resources on, on a couple of occasions. 
So clearly there's going to be a human resource and a financial resource to deliver this strategy. I'm hoping the answer is yes, but, but just a commitment um, that we will um, provide the resource that you need to ensure that we deliver this strategy for the patients and population of Northamptonshire. So there you go, you could answer that one, Simon. Um, the short answer is yes. yes. <laughs> I mean, if there is anything that is more important than treating people who have cancer, as Hemant said, and just to chip in excellent presentation, Hemant, um, to echo everybody else's, but if we're left with one thought today, once every two minutes, somebody gets told that they have cancer. And, um, you know, if you think about that for a, a, a group like ours, it means that we're going to have to be absolutely focused on this in the years that lie ahead. Um, and for all the reasons that you've said, so my um, unequivocal and complete support for this. Great. Thank you, Simon. Uh, Rachel, final question. Um, yeah, I've got a few observations and and also a question. Um, just to echo what Tom said, it was really nice to see virtually on every si slide that the um, patient was in the middle of all of this. And the other thing that it was great to see was the focus on prevention and how we can actually ask our population to do so much more so they don't even find themselves in one of our pathways. But I think there's also things that we can do um, if we do listen to the patients that um, when, when a patient is told they have cancer, that they sort of hand over control to the, to the, to the medical staff that are seeing them um, generally. And there's a few things we can do that are really simple. And we've talked about this at Cancer Board. And one is always to leave with your next appointment and knowing when it's going to be. And that's such a simple thing, but it's very, very powerful for a patient. And the other thing is the increasing role of prehab and rehab, because equally that is something a patient can do as well. And I, I know in the last year, it's been so difficult to run patient engagement sessions, um, but actually the more we can get the patients to do for themselves and they feel they are actually participating in their treatment and, the, and have some control over it, the better. Sorry, it's probably not a question, more an observation, Hemant. Well, I think can I just, can I just respond to it? Can I just Please. respond to Rachel? Rachel, uh, to your first point, I completely agree uh, that if I was a patient, I want to go out with an appointment. And if you look at our recent pathways, the colorectal pathway and the rapid prostate pathway, when the patient gets a elect, uh, uh, the telephone triage by the nurse specialist on the first contact, he is given on that phone call his MRI appointment and his one-stop clinic appointment. And the same is across colorectal, and that is what we are extrapolating to other tumor sites. So I completely accept and agree. And here where I think technology might help as well, uh, uh, making this easier forward. And this is where we are working on a, a on iBox solution, especially for urology as a proof of concept. The second question is prehab. Absolutely, as I've said, uh, uh, you know, it is it is the most vital and important because it not only is about care after the treatment, but it makes the patients fitter to undergo the treatment. It is more about the psychological aspect of it. And, and, and you have been on cancer board. We had a, a, a prehab representation uh, from uh, a project re uh, presentation a couple of months back. And I'm pleased to say that, you know, we will be launching prehab as a pilot in colorectal uh, uh, from this month. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Helen. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much. Well, Hemant, um, you know, I think you've uh, had a lot of very, very positive comments there to, um, to the articulation of your strategy. And we really do wish you the best of luck with this. As everyone says, it's, uh, this is absolutely vital to, uh, to the health of the Northamptonshire population. And, um, you know, I think we've heard Simon say that resources, uh, both human and financial, uh, won't be a problem. Um, not that they won't be a problem, but uh, Come back to the board if you're having a problem, Hemant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So thank you very, very much. Really great presentation and uh, and good luck to you. Thank you. With your permission, I will leave, Chair. Thank you very much. Yep, absolutely. Thank you. Um, okay, so the, uh, the final substantive item on the agenda is uh, item 18, and this is the uh, dedicated to excellence, the group's strategic direction. 
Uh, and I believe that the board is going to be asked to approve this, Simon. Is that correct? Yep. Um, so um, really, um, it's a perfect segue from the previous item, uh, David, um, because if we're going to start doing some of the things that heaven inspires for us to do. We have to start thinking not just about today and how do we survive, but we have to start thinking tomorrow. And what does that mean? Um, and how do we organise ourselves to deliver? So we've got a short presentation to take us through, which I'm hoping will now magically appear. Um, uh, excellent, it did. That is really good. Um, so next slide. So look, um, uh, the first thing is just about saying um, this is built off um, this. The, what I'm going to present to you today is built off what loads of people have contributed over. You know, I'll, I'll share with you in a second who has contributed to that. But it's it's not our words that are speaking today. It's the words of our staff, our stakeholders, our patients, our communities here. Um, and I just wanted to say thanks. Um, you know, people are given of their time freely, willingly and completely to help us get to where we are today. And it's uh, hopefully something that they will recognise, hopefully something we can support. Next slide, please. Um, and here it is, you know, masses of people um, have contributed. Um, it's been a huge um, undertaking and uh, just to say thanks to everybody who has helped us get to the point where I'm able to present this to you today. Next slide, please. This reminds you where we started. Um, it's the product of six months work and I'm going to walk through probably just very briefly, quite a lot of the material that you've seen before, but just to remind you of it and to bring it together into one place and say, this is now where we are, this is now where we set our course. And I suppose the thing today, this message here is, look, in setting our course today, if Alan were here, challenging my inner Alan, I suppose for a second, um, he would say, this is the thing that we are going to stick with, this is the thing that we are going to come back to, we're not going to change, as we get these things now, as we move them um, forward, these are where we will be. These are where we will be for the next um, three to five years. Next slide, please. So if we just click up the uh, whole of this slide, um, everybody's had a, a sight of this, I think now, but just to formally put in front of us all our vision and mission statement. Um, and we've debated this extensively um, uh, across a variety of the settings that I've talked about before. Vision focused on our future, mission focused on, you know, the, the here and now and how do we do what we do. And that strapline, I think, dedicated to excellence, which Hemant just referred to, which I think is something that inspires us every day to try and do better and be better. Next slide. So um, we, as I know, if you can put up the whole slide, thank you. Um, as you know, that we've, we've, we've spent a lot of time talking to people about what they wanted from the organization in terms of values. Um, it's threaded throughout our conversation today, hasn't it? So when we were talking about maternity services, for example, we were talking about the culture. We we're talking about the way people need to feel as staff when they work in those very high pressured, very scrutinized services. And here you see, um, and it's powerful just to see it again as the kind of end of our conversation today, what we want for ourselves, what we want for our staff, what we want for our patients, those core values of compassion, integrity, respect, accountability, courage and ambition, supportive and inclusivity, but also looking to the future, recognizing that we are going to be changing. Um, we've just been talking about the work that we're doing around the ICS, and that is really going to need to challenge us on our collaboration, our inclusivity, our integrity, our innovation. Next slide, please. And so as we um, conclude this piece of work, um, here now are the values that we um, will bring together as a group, um, building on a strong story from both hospitals who both had strong traditions of highly values-based organizations. This is now where we land, compassionate, respectful, accountable, integrity, and courageous. And these words, they resonate for me, as I said, not just because they are powerful in their own right, but they are powerful because they are built off the shoulders of hundreds of conversations that we've had over the last six months. And we set ourselves this task of being consistently excellent in these areas. 
That doesn't mean we will achieve this every day, but it is a goal, I think, something that we can walk into work every morning and feel, yes, this is something to aim for. This is something to strive for. Next slide, please. Um, I thought I would share with you just a few moments um, of the feedback. There's a, obviously huge amounts of feedback that we've had, and you can see it here. Um, so, as I've said, this is something that has been built off the feedback that people have given us. Patients and staff like the joint focus. People welcome the proposed focus on inclusivity, collaboration and teamwork. People like that the ambition centres on excellent. There's curiosity and excitement. You heard Heminent re uh, reference it about how that university hospital status helps synergise with some of our clinical ambitions. We've got a strong core values. But again, coming through the thread of all of the communications that we've had is we have to and we need to do better on communication. Next slide, please. So I'm not going to walk through all of this um, and uh, because you've seen it before, but to remind you, um, there are our group priorities at the top. Um, I'll leave you to reflect on them. There are the next line down in the middle swim lane there. There are the things that you see in terms of our success measures over three to five years. So this is now how we judge progress. And the point I want to make here is all of these, for us to be truly excellent as a hospital, all of these have to be delivered. And you can see cancer there in the middle. Um, and then our focus over 21, 22. So as we look to the year ahead, what are we focused on delivering? And again, many of the themes that have come out in our conversation, um, question earlier on about um, super-stranded patients, and you can see reflected there in our aspirations around systems and partnerships. Next slide. But we also know um, that this is not just about what we do in 21, 22. This is about things that will be our drumbeat over the next three to five years. And again, all of these have to come together. Our people plan, our clinical strategy, our nursing and midwifery and allied health professional strategy, the work that we do on the ICS, our estates program, our academic strategy, our digital strategy, our financial strategy. These are things that are going to infuse, inform, drive, sit behind some of our more local and immediate priorities. And over the months ahead, you will be debating all of these. So in March, as Mark has said, you'll be debating the people plan. And Andy plans to bring the digital strategy in March. So we start to see that the pillars get built of what we are talking about over the next three to five years. Next slide. We also know that one of the biggest tasks that we've got is to build approach around transformation. Here we're now moving still to the work in progress. We had an excellent CPC um, earlier on um, this month in which we looked at the progress that we need to make here. But hospitals that, uh, and again, um, if Mark was speaking, he would be saying, you know, the key thing here is that we give people the opportunity to make a difference in their own jobs and give them the power to make the changes that help deliver that. And if we link that to the cancer conversation, how do we help people like Hemant feel empowered to really not only have to come to us for approval and support, but also feel like I can make those changes in cancer services um, across NGH, but more broadly across the group. To the next slide, please. Um, governance. Um, so we should um, make sure, and I only want to bring out two points here, that the governance is designed to support us delivering this whilst recognising the responsibilities of statutory boards. And um, as we've already said, there are clear opportunities for the committees to work together and some really powerful work that we've seen. Um, the People Committee, for example, is a really good example of how we've started to learn from each other and do things once. The Quality Committee is starting to do that too, I think. Next slide, please. So this is our timeline or the first of it. Um, so you can see, um, and it will get populated as we go. Um, I'm not going to talk through all of this, but you can see that there is 
an, a, an ambitious program of work. Um, and you can see there the first two or three things that I've talked about. And I should have mentioned, um, hopefully, that we'll also be bringing back the nursing midwifery and AHP strategy as well. We had a question about retention earlier on and, you know, driving retention. We need to make sure that we are the place that people want to come and work. Important, too, that we review and so we are going to be coming back to this. It's not just something that we've now created and put in a desk drawer somewhere and occasionally pull out. This informs our conversations at board. Next slide, please. So this brings it back together. Um, so this here, I started with a kind of almost a, a vacant space in terms of the triangle. Now you start to see it pulled together here as everything that we believe, everything that we are setting ourselves to do. Um, I'm not going to talk through all of this, but it is a really powerful tool now to say, um, here's what we are about. And then that leads me to my final slide. So hopefully today we're asking you to receive and comment on the strategy, to acknowledge the huge collaborative effort um, to make comments, if you would like to, on the key areas of action, to confirm your approval for the vision, mission and values, the group priorities and the initiatives. Thank you very much. I'd like to, um, if I may, just ask Rachel as one of the co-chairs of um, CPC to comment at this point. Um, she's been incredibly supportive and involved in the development of this work. And Rachel, what would you like to add? Thanks, Simon. Um, just a few things. So picking up on your theme of how many people we talk to, I sat in on some of those engagement sessions. Um, I think you ran them, Simon. And that there was a real buzz about people being asked. They, I think they were absolutely delighted and welcomed it with open arms. And we did change, uh, make changes to our strategy as the feedback came in. Um, we thought about it, took everything on board. Um, Second point is that we started this ages ago, it seems, in another life, but actually it was about six months ago. And I'd just like to thank all the execs who um, gave up their time, especially on Monday mornings. I acknowledge it's not a great time if you're operationally focused to have a meeting. Um, but, and I know the pressures that you have to go and do your day jobs, but thank you very much. This, this has been arrived at from, you know, with involvement from everyone, and it's really important we collectively sign up to this. Thirdly, we're going to face, no doubt, some challenges as we go through the next few years. Um, we're going to have difficult decisions. We've, we've got to almost be unapologetically single-minded over this. They're, they're priorities for a reason. Everything can't be a priority. It doesn't mean to say we can't do other things, but we have to come back to this. And yes, we have to check it's right every so often and just check in that it's still the right thing to do. But we need to all agree that these are our priorities. Um, and the last one really is um, a plea to the committee chairs. We all have to collectively deliver this. As a CPC, we're, we're clear we have a role in driving the focus and making sure it happens. But as Simon um, said, this should inform your conversations, not just at board, but actually in your committees. We need you to have this on the agenda. And when you meet, please debate these priorities and help us move them forward. Um, but yeah, that's it. Thank you to all concerned. Uh, Debbie, you wanted to come in, I think. Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, just to say that absolutely confirm approval um, for the, the things that you outline on the slide. I think it's a really good strategy. Um, I am fully behind it, 100%. Uh, it's easy to write things on paper, isn't it? Less easy to start delivering them. So the challenge is, is now and, and ongoing, really. And I think that the, the trust as a whole is really valued the inclusivity of being involved in this um, and we must continue to do that as we move forward so yeah 100 percent behind it thank you jill sorry <laughs> unmuted um obviously echo just everything that debbie said um what i'm wondering is this if this can now be used as a lever um 
to, to spread out the message, if you like. So I was very struck in, in um, Himant's presentation about the prevention agenda that isn't, isn't really within our, our remit um, in usual circumstances, but is so important. It, it's pretty um, disappointing to know that we are well below the, um, the national average, for example, of cervical screening. Um, so how, how can we influence and support that to improve? How, how can we work with our public health colleagues um, to, to, to work on the, on the prevention work that will um, enable us to deliver our group strategy even, even better? So is probably going to come in because I was going to bring you in, but thank you for sticking your hand up anyway, Karen, um, because Karen's leading our work facing outwards into the ICS. Um, do you want to add your thoughts about how we integrate this to the kind of population health based approach that um, people are talking about? Well, thank you, Simon. That's exactly why I put my hand up. I just wanted to add that obviously I completely support the, the, the strategy and the approach and in particular um, our focus on, on, um, on empowering our staff to continuously improve, but the links um, out with our sorry the links with our um, externals um, well with the system across the system and I think absolutely key will be how we develop our group clinical strategy and the ICS strategy and we bring all this together as part of the um, overall strategy to deliver our, our group priorities so that's what I was just going to comment on. Thanks uh, Karen and just to say Jill our board development session at the end of February yeah. and, and to major our discussion in terms of with Karen's support obviously uh, on our ICS strategy. So you'll have an opportunity to explore in detail, how do we engage in that wider prevention agenda, that population health management approach? Because I think we do need to spend some dedicated time on it. And I know Alan's really keen that we do that. Um, John. <coughs> Thank you. Um, given that the, uh, well, so first of all, I want to absolutely support and give my approval for this uh, strategy. Um, my one question is there's going to need quite a significant investment, uh, both financial and, and other. What is your level of confidence that we can get the necessary financial um, investment, particularly for things like the digital strategy, which doesn't come cheaply? Um, we're already investing um, as two separate hospitals quite significantly um, in quite a lot of these areas. And um, I guess tactically, one of the things that we need to explore is what's the opportunity that we've got to align our investment more concretely together when we look at it together. Let me give you a really practical example of that, John. Across the two hospitals, we spend just under £3 million um, per annum on transformation. Um, that's a big investment. Yeah. And we've never thought about what could we do? That was that slide I showed you with a kind of hexagon on it. What could we do if we brought that funding together and could we do better with it? And logically you'd have to assume, wouldn't you, I think, that we could. Uh, and one of the reasons why that hexagon is so important and that's still the work in progress at the moment. As I said, CPC had an opportunity to debate it and I think it will come back to CPC in a, in a few weeks time um, is we've got to absolutely make sure we're getting value for money. On the broader strategic piece, um, the financial framework for next year is still not yet clarified. It will be likely that there'll be investment in some areas, particularly in terms of elective recovery, but we know that we're going to have to, as, as Rachel's already said, face some challenging decisions. Yeah. One of the things I think I'd say just by way of conclusion is sometimes we've dissipated our discretionary effort in terms of investment across too broad a range of areas. So this isn't just choosing about the things that we do operationally and clinically. This is also choosing the place we invest our money. Um, Anne. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Simon. It's just following on from uh, John's question really on um, next steps regarding developing the capabilities that we need to deliver this strategy you know really trying to understand what capabilities do we have where are the gaps and what do we need to put in place to make this happen and allied to that looking at the whole communication strategy 
to get this out um, across staff and beyond, you know, into the into the ICS. Um, but it is great to see, you know, the work of everybody's efforts and the staff and patients, and to see this, you know, brought together. It's it's uh, it's really good. Thank you. Um, um, thanks, and and I guess that's a perfect segue into Mark, who also had his hand up to say, oh, okay, <laughs> offer his thoughts because in March, as I said earlier on. Um, the capabilities piece, how do we develop our people, is going to be the next, in fact, the first big thing that we do, we debate. So, Mark, would you um, like to share, without giving too much of your own thunder away, just to give uh, some thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Simon. So, I think um, there's a couple of points that I think are really important, and one of them is just picking up from what Rachel said. It's going to be really important for us as leaders within both of these organisations to hold our nerve with the priorities that we've chosen. There's always a reason to go for many more or, or to change course ever so slightly, but we need to really refocus our attention on those priorities because they have been chosen and worked upon for over six months for a reason. So that's going to be something for us um, to keep uh, close in our minds. The second element... Um, so I think, as I say, that's really important. The second element for me about the how we communicate this um, and our strategy and indeed our values across the organisation, this is going to take a lot of hard work, uh, uh, hence what you've picked up, Anne, which is why you're asking me about the investment element. We cannot forget, as, as Simon has said, the two organisations are quite heavily value driven as, as it stands at the moment. So as an example, this signing up to this strategy, which I would obviously encourage we all do today, means slogans such as a best possible care, our values as they centred in Northampton will change. And that will take some time and it will take a lot of um, effort to have those conversations with people. And what, what's fantastic, actually, is that our people have been the ones that have suggested what our values are to be and, and it obviously contributed to our vision and mission. But we can't underestimate that task. It's going to be ever so important um, to bring that out there. And that is going to take a period of time because it, we, we can't also forget a, a large majority of our conversation has also been reflecting on the fact that we're in the worst pandemic for a, a century. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of work to be undertaken. And of course, that will require some additional investment, but also to build the capability of our people. However, none of that is supposed to be seen as a negative because this can only be a positive thing this is a real this is a real positive and a great timing for us in terms of coming out of this situation that we've been in across both organizations and indeed as a country uh, we've got something we've got something to look forward to for the future this is where we're going to place ourselves and, and and how we're going to move on so i am um, in terms of the capabilities that people plan absolutely as you know and from our draft conversation earlier this week talks about how we can um support people in and around those and support them to deliver the priorities that we set out in this plan uh, which will be ever so important the one other the one thing that the, the very very tiny and i know this is uh, you know everybody knows me for my close attention to detail uh, in the last page of the strategy we just need to swap the co collaboration program committee and the people committee around because they're in slightly different places and you know and as, as everybody knows i'm a real pedant when it comes to things like that but um that was just one other comment but of course i wholly support the strategy and indeed the values roll out um, thanks, Denise. Um, yes, thanks, Simon. Um, uh, actually, Mark's just covered one of the points that I wanted to, which was just asking about the oversight um, and the which committee was was um, was looking at what. Um, so above and beyond that, just again saying it's it's really great, as everyone said, to see it all pulled together um, and uh, wholly support it. So thank you. In the interest of time, David, I'm going to suggest that um, with Denise's comment, we um, draw that discussion to a conclusion and I'll hand back to you. You're on mute, David, if you're talking. Sorry about that, Simon. Had to happen once during the meeting. Yeah. So the board is actually asked to um, to confirm and approve vision, mission, and values, group priorities, and focus for the 2021-22, uh, and the strategic initiatives. From what I've heard, there will be no one who is dissenting to any of the above. Correct. Excellent. Yeah. So we can move forward with that. And now it's all down to delivery. Um, that. Do you have anything more to say, Simon? Or that. Uh, that's fine. Yeah. No, thank you very much. Excellent, good. Uh, closing item, that's questions from the public, which I haven't received. Any questions from the public? Any other business? I haven't received any of that. What I would say is that I think it's absolutely vital to say that the message should cascade down from the board to all our staff 
um, registering our gratitude and thanks for their commitment and sheer hard work during these truly difficult times. And, you know, yeah. our support for them is continuing and our support for them is absolutely unconditional. Um, OK, sorry, Claire, you also have a, your hand up. I'm sorry, apologies. I do have any other business, David. Oh, OK, um, fine. Late, late edition. Um, just for completeness and to ensure we have an audit trail, the board will recall last um, November board, we discussed the integrated care system. And we were asked to do a chair's action between the last board and this board. Um, and I just wanted to confirm that this was signed by Simon as the group CEO with the chair's consent. So we have action back by the required deadline just for the minutes and just for completeness. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Claire. It doesn't take away from the important message that has to cascade down, however, Absolutely. which I think everyone will agree with. OK, uh, that's that's that. The uh, date and time of the next meeting, the 25th of March 2021, uh, a resolution has to be passed. The trust board is invited to adopt the following that representatives of the press and other members, etc., etc. et, cetera, et cetera.